This is The Healthy Healer, where true voice is your medicine. This is where we help doctors and other healers navigate through the challenging times by learning from the best minds in the healing industry. Laugh, cry, and be surprised. It's entertainment, education, and inspiration so you can continue to be the unique and amazing healer you were destined to be. Welcome to humanity. Welcome to The Healthy Healer with Dr. Fred. Hi, it's Dr. Fred, and today I get to introduce you to one of my good friends, one of my colleagues, one of my mentors and my mentees, someone who's been in the field for multiple decades, has taken on so many different roles of being a healer, probably long before he went to medical school. He's articulate, he's funny, he's brilliant, he's a massive contribution to humanity, he's been through the ringer, he's certainly had his ups and downs, he's had his face smashed against brick walls figuratively, and he's taken on challenges that most of us can only dream of. Mark has saved many people's lives, and if anything else, has brought respect to the people he listens to and the people he speaks to. He has a way about him that's unique, but in the end, Mark is just like all of us, a human being who loves being with other human beings and realizes that it is in that connection that healing takes place. Mark's going to talk to us a little bit today about what it means to be healthy and what it means to be a healer and how they interact with each other and how his experience actually taps into all of those areas together and really brings forth somebody who is a true master at being a healthy healer. So enjoy Mark Ibsen. Thanks for being on the show. Bye for now. In order to heal, in order to give away any kind of healing, one has to be aware of what healing's about. And the only way one can really know about what healing's about is to have healed themselves at least on a few occasions. The guest I have today is someone who has healed himself on more than a few occasions. Um, there is, a, he, I, I know, and maybe he'll tell us about a book that might be coming around the corner that actually, sp the title speaks a little bit to how many times that Mark Ibsen has healed himself as a healer. And who he comes back at each and every time is a, mm, a more fortified, a more galvanized, a more committed, a more dedicated, a more experienced healer than he's ever been before. And we all get to capitalize. We all get to uh, reap the benefits of who Dr. Mark Ibsen is for the world. So without further ado, it's my deepest pleasure to introduce you, my listening audience, to my first guest on this Healthy Healer podcast, Dr. Mark Ibsen. Dr. Mark Ibsen, thank you for being on the show. How Look at you in the ski and what's happening over there. Hi, Fred. First, I want to just thank you for having me. And sure. thank you for introducing me to the guy that you're describing. <laughs> exactly. Right. Which is something I wish to live into uh, at a moment by moment basis. So mm -hmm. I'm standing at the top of a ski run with the name of why. So I might be at the corner of why and why not. Um, and I'm, I'm having the opportunity to oh, relive parts of my past or engage in Recreation, which is, of course, recreation. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the healing process for you? I suppose it is. Is that part of the healthy healer? Is I know you love skiing. I mean, after all, you live in a state there where skiing is sometimes the only way to get to the store. So, uh, <laughs> you know, skiing is important to you. What is, tell us a little bit about how skiing and, and physical health and or maybe what does skiing offer for you that leaves you as a healthy healer? I, um, life is a series, or it occurs to me this way, as a series of opportunities to get something or see what there is to see. And skiing is a, is a metaphor for that in, in the nature of breakdowns that lead to breakthroughs. Uh, my first skiing experience was between the legs of my mother up a rope toe. And I, I had a miserable experience and I made it miserable for everybody who was with me. And they didn't go skiing again for six years. Mm. 
and that was the beginning. <laughs> and um, as I look back on it, I, I, I have ties to family. I have ties, ties to Norwegian heritage and Danish heritage. Um, and then I have ties to the exhilaration of moving my body through nature and giving up um, attachments or whatever that is, giving up the yuck that I, that I can gather during the day um, and restoring my soul. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And is skiing, is skiing your number one go-to to get that done? Do you feel like? No, no. Um, as a matter of fact, I've, I'm having a resurgence of, of skiing because, um, because a, as an expert skier, um, uh, skiing is almost easier than walking these days. Mm -hmm. So um, I can access uh, a big chunk of nature efficiently um, without spending days going back in the back country or something like that, which I, which are not available to me these days. So I, I went through a, um, a healing crisis this last year. Yeah. Tell us about had, that. Well, I had, I had a, um, have a history of coronary disease. My father died of a heart attack. His father died of a heart attack. So it's always been there for me. I had an angioplasty 20 years ago, three angioplasties three years ago. And then right in the middle of COVID, I found myself with low energy and ventricular tachycardia when I did my stress test. Mm. So it was really confronting because I feel like I've done all I can to deal with that diagnosis. And yet, you know, some diagnoses must be managed that you don't get to like discard the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So... I ended up with a quadruple bypass, which of course I've been trying to avoid most of my life. Yeah. And then there it is. Um, and then this, uh, about six weeks of euphoria that I survived the surgery. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then about six months of profound fatigue and unable to mm. accomplish much. Mm -hmm. like, like move from the bed to the recliner to the dinner table, to the recliner, back to bed, um, and confused by all of that, and confronted by it, and seeking seeking support in in getting through that, or in my case, being type A, seeking support and getting through it faster. Faster, <laughs> Cause, exactly. Cause, right. Cause mm -hmm. it, it takes a year, right? It's like, no, it doesn't take me a year. <laughs> right. That's for normal people. That's yes. for yeah, heathens. The heathens. <laughs> yeah, the the un unwashed masses. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, that that reminds me of the masses. It's it's like if if Karl Marx said religion is the opiate of the masses, then then um. And I'm having this discomfort. Well, I could use some of that opiate. So it has been a spiritual experience, not dying, being alive being being just excited about being alive and then asking my question is this worth it mm. is this what alive looks like for me or what what will this look like later and i was really scared and isolated and and afraid that uh, i'm suddenly old mm. like oh my future's full of um, open back hospital gowns, walkers, and depends. Mm. And mm. like, okay, well, that's hard. That's hard to be with, and maybe it's true. Um, but what can what can I do in the meantime, or mm. or, or or why uh, engage in any of it? Why not just give up and let it mm. all go? And um, so in the process of, of engaging in that conversation, I had this miraculous thing happen, which I feel like I, which at, at the time I thought I had no control over, but I, I got a phone call from a, um, a pain activist colleague of mine, and she was asking for my help. And suddenly I was standing up, mm. erect, full spine, ready to engage mm. and be with her and contribute like I've done all my life. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, where have you been? Mm -hmm. Where has where has this um, ability to contribute been? It was like on sabbatical or something. Yeah. 
and and sabbaticals are important. And so I had a long one. It's fairly enforced, but all of a sudden I now have the energy to get back in the game. Well, Mark, maybe you can help. I, I for those of us who are healers, I think there's a there's a beautiful resonating experience as you speak to that. Uh, you know, almost spontaneous epiphany when she approaches you uh, as asking for help and you show up healthier than you've been for years as a yeah. response to her request. Yeah. One of the reasons I chose to have you be my first interview for here, because I want to, for this uh, podcast, I tell, I wonder if you can explore inside of your soul for a moment. What is it about the request to step into your healership or your, you know, your healing nature that then, um, you know, that then catalyzed you becoming healthy as a direct result of the acceptance of that challenge? Yeah, oh, a great question. Thank you. Um, um, first of all, I think a person a physician can lose track of the fact that they're a healer by operating on the assembly line of medicine Thank you. and having, and having all those chocolates or whatever's on the assembly line going by and forgetting the fact that it's my job to be present and listen to the patient as they're all flowing by me. Um, so, so one opportunity was I was away from it for long enough to appreciate it when it showed up like like a daily schedule of lots of stuff to do puts me into human doing instead of human being mm -hmm. and a for a forced sabbatical has me wondering will i ever be able to do this again and then when the opportunity shows up to jump at it yeah <laughs> as opposed to waking up in the morning and have my coffee and grinding through which i'm good at doing um but the opportunity to just recreate my commitment, my Hippocratic oath, it's like, I'm here to do no harm. Okay, what kind of trouble can I get into doing that? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, exactly. so, and so being away from it is really good, whether it's an hour or uh, six months or something. It's like, it's like Ebenezer Scrooge on Christmas morning for me. It's like, boy, go buy that goose. Um, I'm here, I'm alive, and thank God. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so this is a, a different question, but maybe very similar. So I, I'm going to try to couple these uh, uh, inquiries. The number one, we have it that she approaches you and she activates and galvanizes and restores and, and uh, you know, uh, resets you so that not only are you ready to be a contributing healer, but you're like catapulted in, into being a contributing healthy healer. Now, you're speaking to something a little bit different here, which is the power of the sabbatical or sort of the space you find yourself outside of the medical industrial complex assembly line that allowed, I, I guess I hear you saying that allows you to recalibrate and then refocus what it is for you to carry out the Hippocratic Oath, for instance. Um, can you speak to the merger of those things? And because I think we're getting kind of to the core of Dr. Mark here of what healing and how health, what healing is and how health contributes to being an, um, an effective, uh, you know, divine healer after all. <laughs> A lot of questions. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. no, I love it. Um, a lot of answers. Yeah. Let's sort them out. <laughs> um, so I went through some stuff and we can talk about that if you like, but what, what I, what I went through is a transition in my medical practice um, where I was not allowed to practice for a little bit, um, which you know, really made it. The listeners aren't going to let you get away with that. And we have a few minutes here. Give us the, give us a little bit of a thumbnail of this stuff that you went through. Well, uh, I ran an emergency medicine practice for about 35 years I opened an urgent care in 2010, co-located with a natural medicine clinic, and that was just thrilling and, and, and um, really rich conversations between me and the natural medicine people. And I, I, got, to, I got to be a guide um, across the River Styx 
into the medical system for people who were terrified of it. And it was just my privilege to do that for them. Um, at some point, pain patients started coming in who, were, who had been dropped from their opiates and they were in withdrawal. Having kicked that can down the road as an ER doctor for 35 years, I decided, well, there's a lovely little can in the road. Maybe I'll pick it up. And, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, it transformed my practice. And I was able to help hundreds of patients wean off their opiates because they'd been taken away. And they were no longer trusting of the medical system to keep treating them. 20% mm. uh, of those patients wouldn't wean, and I had to. I was stuck with them as patients. And so I had, I've, I'm suddenly a pain doctor. And what I under, understood about pain is that I am well trained in treating pain. I've had two back surgeries, one heart surgery, Achilles tendon rupture, a um, bunch of surgeries, kidney stones. And so I've had my own share of pain in my life, which makes me a ninja if yeah, you're having pain. Exactly. Um, and, and so that training came to, came to, bear when pain patients showed up for my help because I could realize that yes there's no objective measurement of pain it's subjective um, I've been in agony before and I consider I consider ignoring a patient's agony to be a violation of my Hippocratic oath of do okay. no harm yes so uh so then I find myself outside for a while and then and then my clinic closed and all that, all that went away and Montana became a wasteland for pain management. And I was out, like, I didn't want to go to prison. So I was, I'm out. Um, and I explained that to my patients. I said, I can't help you if they take away my license or put me in prison. I'm going to do my best to help you up to that point. And then at some point it, it became clear to me that I couldn't help anymore. So after about seven years out of that conversation, all of a sudden this call from Kristen, I'm in pain or my husband's in pain and he can't have his medicines. Can you help us? Now I'm trained to say, yes, I can help with that. And, and the way I can help someone who's desperate is to acknowledge that there's a desperate situation, acknowledge that they're having a sense of betrayal because they've been let down by the system. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, and then say to that patient, together, we're going to work something out. I'm no longer the patriarchal. Here's your prescription person. I'm more like, hey, I, you know, you fell into a hole. I'm jumping down in with you, and I know the way out. Right. So here, this is the way, and we'll design it together in a powerful conversation and partnership as opposed to me just writing a script. Right. Yeah, it's super beautiful. So here's what I, there's another two pieces here that I think we're adding. So now I think we might be up to either three or four pieces that I'd love for you to continue to integrate. We, we started, you know, sort of like on the first day of Christmas here. And um, so she activates you, right? She, act, she, calls you after, she calls you after seven years, hits you up with this invitation. You're, you're a yes before you even have time to think about it. And <clears throat> not only that, it comes with the extra added bonus of a new level of health that you hadn't experienced in, in you know, at all, ever. Exactly, yes. And so like, those two like things, a gift, not yeah. like a burden, but like a gift, like a gift. Correct. Beautiful. All right. So we got that piece and that's going to be the central piece. But the next piece we have is this thing called a sabbatical or taking rest or being on the slopes or uh, rethinking who you are as a human or what, you know, what your commitment to where, where you can go up to up to a point, but ignoring someone's chronic pain is an unacceptable aspect of your interpretation mine as well um of uh of the hippocratic oath so you then speak a bit to this semi or really in fact forced um sabbatical that you had for a number of reasons not only do you have your your surgeries um you know your your the the, the painful surgeries that you had but you also get this challenge from the uh administrative juris dictions of the medical world and you're on break you know you're on break you're not not being an active healer and not you know not being uh reimbursed as such not being you know you still identify as a doctor but in some ways you're not sure if and when you're ever going to come back and so there's a rest period here that's very real 
But then you speak and to Fra- a Fred. Frankly, it's not a break. It's a it's being in exile. Yeah, exile. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's much better. Much better. Yeah, it's exactly what it was. <laughs> but now you speak to a third piece, and I guess I brushed up into it here, and that is your own experience as a human needing healing, like your own experience of, and and then succeeding in receiving healing so what it took for you to get over the there are obstacles in accepting healing from another right i mean especially for doctors say more about that mark i think we all we all kind of know it but coming from someone with your with your level of of experience i think this will be extremely valuable what does that well, mean especially for if, doctors? if who i am is a healer then by golly, I'm doing the healing, not you. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not true, of course. Yeah. You know, we're just a pencil in the hand of God, as Mother Teresa would say. But uh, at, at some point, if I'm not a healer, then who am I? Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, for me, earlier on in my in my healthcare um, career as being a patient, I had a lot of resistance to being a patient. There's a lot of vulnerability for a patient to be lying on a gurney, looking up at somebody vulnerable open, powerless, um, praying for a good outcome and surrendering to a system that we're supposed to be driving. I mean, it's basically, okay, you're not in the back seat of this thing. You're in the way back. You're in the truck bed. Um, and so I'm not driving. Someone else is driving. That takes something for me to say, okay, uh, all right, you got to, you, you're, you're driving. I'm the patient. I got to, find out how to be a patient, mm-hmm. uh, which is eye-opening mm-hmm. um, from the standpoint of the spiritual nature of saying, you know, um, I'm a doctor. I'm the master of all this. How dare illness show up in my life? <laughs> it's like mm-hmm. it's like denial. I mean, denial gets us through medical school residency and, and, and Mrs. Jones on room three, but, but it, it's also like, um, it's a smack in the, it's, it's just like, ah, <laughs> yeah. I am getting the perspective of what it's like to be vulnerable and need some help and then allow it to manifest itself. Like I'm an outrageous critic of the conventional medical model dealing with the irony of somebody splitting my chest open. Exactly. Right. And undergoing the process of being a patient and seeing what does it take to be a really great patient? Um, like I, when I was in the at the Cleveland Clinic having my surgery, I was focused on contributing from horizontal, like thanking the nurses, acknowledging the housekeeping people, um, uh, letting go of small things, um, and then and then insisting that the that the important things be handled. Like I extubated myself because I was in agony. <laughs> And they weren't treating my pain and so I didn't this is not a mindful thing as a reflex no. but so it's not but, a recommend not a recommendation for people in a no. listening audience that are thinking no. about exhibiting no. themselves not a good idea necessarily like a misadventure like I'm I'm in the middle or cause of a medical misadventure and now how to deal with that okay that no. happened there's a consequence and and then I can show up again so lots of lots of places to be vulnerable which I think as a male, as a white person, as a uh, sometimes male, uh, a- as a person who's uh, powerful and in, and in demand, being vulnerable is is a new place for me to live, mm-hmm. and and an opportunity to really learn some stuff. And I did. Well, I am, <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. Well, one of the things I think that we share is this idea of the you, the. Uh... The more experiences you have looking at uh, different, you know, different places to take on the elephant, like di- from different positions, different vantage points and uh, of the, uh, you know, different viewpoints of the elephant, you get a, maybe you get access to what the elephant might look like. If you can really see it from the side, from the front, from inside, from outside, from, you know, from the, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, from the left, from the right, et cetera, um, the top and the bottom. And 
you really have had a host of experiences as a, we'll say as a recipient or patient, as a provider, as a contributor, a healer, a doctor, um, as someone who's been outside the field, as someone who's been uh, fighting from within the field, who's someone who's been fought with by the field, um, and then, you know, and then actually saving lives too. Like being on the front end of an extremely delicate conversation is where you now find yourself. So extremely delicate. And of course, we've had many conversations with that. But talk to us a little bit about what are you doing now as a healthy healer? I have three aspects to my practice now, and it's, it's, it's very dynamic. But the first is my cannabis practice, um, which has been going on for about 10 years. Uh, the next is a, uh, a practice doing a study on outpatient ketamine without needing the infusions and stuff. And third is this new opportunity that Kristen gave me when she called me. Um, and basically, it's, it's taking care of opiate refugees, people who've been abandoned by the system again. And it's like I dove back into a thing that nearly killed me and my, it killed, did kill my practice. And the, the stars were aligned for me to do that. Um, it, it felt this, this exile and this sideline. It almost felt like being on the sideline with a game going on and being invited to get back on the court and actually being able to, mm -hmm. there'll be a time where I, where I can't, but that's not now. So, so treating patients who've been abandoned by their doctor and the system who have, um, or who are suffering from withdrawal from losing access to their pain medication is an opportunity to help them or be with them through their desperate time and know that they're not alone. Beautiful. Beautiful. When you, thank you for sharing that. When you, if you can look back to that long, long, long ago when you graduated medical school, did it look anything like this to you? Did you have any? <laughs> what, no, what? <laughs> no, no I, I, there's at least seven or eight transformative iterations of my career. Um, I was going to be a family doctor in Hitching Post, Wyoming or something and get, do everything for everybody which is a um, medical practice from the past that is no longer present today. So I got trained in family practice and then I grandfathered into emergency medicine. And then my emergency medicine career went through multiple iterations, including this opportunity to learn how to do ultrasound. And it's, and it's complicated. It's in my case. I know. <laughs> um, and so learning Learning how to do ultrasounds in, at the bedside for the ER was just a transformative thing. Then learning how to be an urgent care doc, then learning how to be a pain care doc, and then learning how to, learning how to navigate the minefield of a medical board investigation from a hostile medical board. Yeah. And also be with the intensity and the fear and the confrontation of having the DEA all over me yeah um and and um with the conversation uh, from the dea being dr ibsen you're risking your freedom and your license by prescribing to patients like these and of course my smart aleck response is patients like what and the dea agent says well patients who might divert their pain medicines and i say well isn't that everybody <laughs> like how do you how do you have a radar that tells you who's taking their medicine at what time and they're, they're taking it right? And, and do I have to do that? And why mm -hmm. are you asking the doctor to be a detective, a police officer, a regulator, as well as a gatekeeper? And it's like, it's impossible to be empathic and care about people and then be their police officer too. Right. Beautiful. Challenges. And, it, and it's, it's 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 uh, it's asking me for a lot, and I'm just pleased and honored to have the energy to deliver. Yes, indeed, and we're really really happy to be on the recipient end, or in this case, a friend end of um, of you being able to be uh, sort of the the highest newest revitalized uh, Dr. Ibsen that's ever existed before, and you're pretty darn good beforehand. Thank you. Well, there, I think I, I think there's an opportunity to assume um, 
to move on from being a lone wolf ER doc, it's time for your chest tube, to move into a sort of an emeritus role and, and step back from that. And um, not that that's wrong. Um, I just can't do it for 12 hours <laughs> in an ER shift. Um, so the opportunity for me is to say, well, what's next? What is next? Or, or, or for me, why not? And, okay. and that, that involves being coachable and, and letting stuff open up, which, which has a certain amount of uncertainty and risk to it. Mm -hmm. like, uh, like being out on a branch, feeling like I'm sawing the limb and I'm on the other end of the limb. Yeah. Like treating a pain patient who dies and the terror of that. Um, and, and the gift I have of people in my life, like my brother told me, you decided to help Kristen. When you did that, you were inspired. Yeah, but now I'm scared. And he, and he basically just said, too bad. Yeah, too bad. You've already jumped. Right. You know, your only, your only task is to make yourself inspired every day. Yeah. And, and I think that's good for all of us as doctors is to, is to get back to why we went into this and give up our resentment. And I have a ton of it. And it's just taken me years to give that up. This resentment, like, this is not how I... This is not what I signed up for. And of course, the answer to that is, of course not. And, and there's a little joke in the irony about that. But it's also, it's like, okay, what if it's better? Mm. <laughs> exactly. That could be amazing if it's better than what I signed up for, which yeah. is just to serve people. And I could actually do that again and be more yeah. effective at it. Whew. Yeah, beautiful. And I don't need a medical license to do that, by the way. No, you don't do. That's right. <laughs> it's like, There's okay, I can do that right now. It's amazing. Mark, I know that there's another part of you that, that is ready to put this into uh, the archives, like the written archives. Maybe uh, get yourself a book or like uh, actually speak a little bit to uh, who you've been, who you are, and where you're going. Kind of like the uh, past, present, and future of who you are. And all sorts of ideas on how to make that happen. Um, can you speak a little bit to what does the future hold? Or you know, now that you've told us a little bit about where you've been, a little bit about who you are, um, let's say it's a little bit better. It doesn't matter, by the way, if it's better, or worse, or the same. Right here it is. Yeah. Uh, what's what's uh, what's it, what is next for you? What do you see two, three, four years in a row? Well, I, I thanks for that. That's I tend to function in a, a shorter, a shorter future than that. And so, well, well, I see myself saying repetitive things and answering repetitive questions from patients who are confused, upset, and betrayed. Well, there's got to be a book in there or a manual. And, and, you know, I would call it something like your doctor doesn't work for you anymore. Yeah. Um, your doctor has, you know, the exam room's crowded. There's you, me, your lawyer, my lawyer. I knew that when I took this on in 1976. Um, and by the way, all the older doctors hated that. Yeah. They were all upset about tort reform and all that. And that's so, that's so done. That's so 1980. Um, and, um, and now I see that uh, the exam room is full of regulators and legislators and governors and lawyers and and pharmacists, and we used to be colleagues with pharmacists. Now they're the gatekeeper. Like, how did that happen? No kidding. Um, and um, and so I'm seeing opportunities for how to how to create workability in a system that just doesn't seem workable. Um, and that might be for the patient to go stealth. Like, maybe the system isn't helping us because we're asking the wrong things of it. Either either bring sacred medicine to the system. Or engage in sacred medicine by generating it yourself. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, amazing, and so that sounds like it leads it leaves you as a frontiersman, as a as maybe a, uh, a, a maybe an activist or uh, maybe an ambassador, um, a creator of something that doesn't presently exist, um, or at least a co-creator with uh, other folks who are um, semi. Um, what, how did they say it? Uh, you know, like-minded per se. Um, 
what is that is that a fair ex assessment of where you're at where you're looking for, to make a difference in ways that as, up until now haven't existed yes or i didn't even see them yeah yeah before yeah. it was up to me and and now i can see that uh, collaboration particularly with the patient um creating conversations like like my pain refugee patients are too sick to march it would be instead of march for the cure it'd be march limp for the cure so so how can I advocate for them and with them, but realizing that it's, it's the patients that are going to be listened to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's 1,500 of my colleagues who've been incarcerated for treating patients compassionately. And, and these, these doctors are accused of being drug dealers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the way to know if someone's a drug dealer or not is whether or not they have a medical license. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the drug dealers don't have medical licenses. Right. Um, and the Controlled Substance Act is designed to protect us. And it's been contaminated by, a, by an interpretation about what is within the usual professional practice mm -hmm. or, or the DEA will, will, take, will be, take a DEA agent, come to a doctor, feign illness. And if we treat that patient in the wrong way, we've committed a crime, even though the patient's creating a crime by lying to us in the first place or the non-patient. So, so there's lots of minefields for us to navigate. And the temptation is to say, screw it. Sure. I'm, I'm out. That's not. And, and the more people that say, screw it, I'm out, is leading to a colossal breakdown that's currently happening. Like, like a, a, a patient of mine on 30 milligrams of oxycodone can only get a five milligram oxycodone tablet. And I prescribe it. And the pharmacist says, I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah. And, and where, you know, that patient's left in a very vulnerable position. Yeah. I'm not introducing any of my French terms today. Um, so. Um, yeah, we'll say that's the late night podcast. That we'll do. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. So, OK, now what do I do? How, how do I support a patient who's not getting their pain medicines and yeah. feels betrayed? Well, I get in conversation with them and, and, and we join groups that are helping us create other ways, including stealth. Like my instructions for my patients who are off their opiates, there's only one market now. The, the, the legal market's gone. And, you know, if you want, if you want pain medicine treatment, you got to talk to Miguel or Bobby Joe or some guy in a corner. And then if you're going to do that, how can you put some structure in to keep yourself safe? Like have a baby monitor so someone right. can watch your breathing, et cetera. So, so there are ways they don't necessarily fit in the, bell curve right in the middle it's way out beyond the two deviations yeah, and, just, and just to be sure it's not again sort of like the same thing as uh not recommending self-extubation uh, right this isn't a direct this isn't like a direct uh prescription to go find your meds you know mail order from canada or something it's not what you're right. saying no what i'm saying is if you end up doing that like 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 it's like this for patients i think that's what they're telling me and i believe them a key factor is believe to actually believe patient. your patient. Yeah. Um, but if your patient's telling you they're in agony and they're going to die without their opiates, my my thought is, well, if oxygen were illegal, you're, you'll fight for it for three to six minutes. And then that fight's over. So, so it's natural. It's natural to pretend that that conversation doesn't exist. So I voice it because it's already there. Right. And so um, and I go, well, if you're going to do that, here's what happened to Prince. And here's what happened to Tom Petty, who took con um, counterfeit medications and died. Well, don't die. Yeah. Don't let this kill you. Yeah. Don't let the you know, don't don't let the regulators get you down. Yeah. Um, don't show them by getting out of the game up your game. And here's and if you do that, here's how to do that safely. So, yeah, awesome. not a not a um, not a recommendation to be criminal. It's an invitation for Robin Hood medicine. Exactly. And Robin Hood functions because King Richard's gone. Well, we start looking at it sounds like what we're really looking at is, you know, the, the future is not coming at us fast. Uh, you know, probably by the time this this show airs, which isn't very long, maybe next week. But by the time this uh, podcast is really moving along, uh, this particular conversation becomes obsolete. We have so many different new avenues 
um, developing in the technological world, in the information management world, uh, in the artificial intelligence world. There's so many things that are going on um, that really, uh, more than anything, Mark, I look at you on the slopes and I, I, uh, I envy that you've got yourself out there on this beautiful Sunday, making a difference in your own world so that you can be healthy and you can be the healer you came here to be. So you're a tremendous example of someone who looks at all the ins and outs and is, I really appreciate you sharing with our listening audience um, what it really takes to be a, a, a bona fide senior healer, someone who's, uh, and you know, just learning every day, like today's your first day, you know, like today's your first day again. And, and that's really what you're doing. So thank you for being that. It's my pleasure to be with you, Fred. Thank you. Thank you. And so let's talk a little bit. Uh, I'm sure my I'm sure the law audience is going to be like, wait, how how who is this guy, and how can I get a hold of him? If someone wants to find you, follow you, learn from you, uh, consult with you, something like that. What's the what's the easiest and best way to find you? 406-439-0752. Wow. <laughs> and so uh 406-439-0752 is mark's phone number and uh it's <laughs> rare that somebody is giving out their phone number and i remember i actually did the same thing on my first facebook live and my my host at the time was like stunned that i did that but in the end um what i think that that represents is like no really call me like, you know, no, really, yep. if, you got, if you got something here, like it's, I, I, that's what I do. I heal people and I heal people through conversations. And I think that's what you're hearing Dr. Mark Gibson say to us today. So that's beautiful. Mark, if someone doesn't have a phone, how can they find you on email or in your website? Um, Mark Musher, M-U-S-H-E-R, Ibsen, I-B-S-E-N at gmail.com. Dr. Mark 406 is my website. That's good. Facebook under Dr. Mark Ibsen, or Dr. just Facebook under Mark Ibsen, or my Facebook page, which is Dr. Mark 406. Okay, good. And and hopefully by the time this airs, we'll have a we'll have a bio of you, a little short bio, and we'll have a headshot so people can recognize you uh, <laughs> with and without the uh, the ski helmet. Mark, there's so many things we could talk about, and it's a pleasure being your friend. I really, really honor you for coming on the show today and for kicking this off in the direction I was hoping for. Um, you know, go out there and get them. It looks like you have a beautiful day in the sunny slopes and you got some powder down there and it's not, not too bad. Not too bad. It's uh, uh, yeah. Paradise. Not too bad. Not well too said. Bad. Yeah. All right, Mark, take care of yourself. Take care of everyone else. Give you, give your family and your friends a hug. And uh, I guess you're in Colorado now. Is that right? This moment. I'm, I'm standing at, at the top of Hesperus mountain. Mm -hmm. Uh, small little ski area mm -hmm. and in fact what i what i realized is that i don't know if i ski this enough maybe i'll become an honorary hesperado, a hesperado. Um, I don't know if they have that, yeah i don't know if they have that bumper sticker yet but i'm going for it and that is that uh is that a picture of montana on the side of your helmet is that is that montana that it is yeah and that's that's your, like your home that's like one of your homes as well yeah right yes <laughs> Mark, be good, man. Great to see you. Uh, take care. It was really beautiful. Thank you, Fred. You're welcome. I love you. Keep contributing. I love you, too. Don't ever stop. Or when you do, pick a time to start up again. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Love Peace. you, man. Love you, too. Bye. Bye for now. Bye-bye. So wasn't that amazing? What a great conversation with my good friend, Dr. Ibsen. And Dr. Mark Ibsen is up to so many great things in the world. And all he really is, is a day-to-day -day example of what it means to be a healer, what it means to be healthy, and then the really incredible, we'll call it synergistic experience of being a healthy healer. Mark knows his role as a healer. He knows that he is following something called First I Do No Harm. And he knows that he has people who desperately want and need his services, his uniquely qualified services to bring forth the kind of human and the kind of healer he came on earth to be. This is the kind of thing that a healthy healer can provide. And I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. This is a man who is really off doing what's important to him in other words, actually getting himself healthy. There he was, you know, on the slopes in Colorado while he takes his call. And then speaking to the truth in an honest way 
the delicate truth, the frightening truth, the real truth of what it means to be healthy and how to be a patient, how to ask for help, how to receive help, how to be in the, you know, uh, the truck load <laughs> rather than the driver's seat. So many things that Dr. Mark shared with us. And I hope you found this to be as inspiring and as contributing as I did. A deep pleasure to introduce you to my good friend, Dr. Mark Gibson, and there'll be more along the other end of this podcast. We'll probably have Mark come back. I think that would be a good idea. In the meantime, make sure you follow him because this guy's up to super cool stuff. And just by being with him, I find myself not only getting healthier, but becoming a better healer. So thanks for joining us on The Healthy Healer. I'm so glad you're here. Feel free to, I don't know, share this with other folks. Um, you leave comments and likes and whatever else is out there in whatever platform you're catching this on. And we will catch you on the flip side. It's Dr. Fred. Bye for now. This is The Healthy Healer, where true voice is your medicine. This is where we help doctors and other healers navigate through the challenging times by learning from the best minds in the healing industry. Laugh, cry, and be surprised. It's entertainment, education, and inspiration so you can continue to be the unique and amazing healer you were destined to be. Welcome to humanity. Welcome to The Healthy Healer with Dr. Fred. Hi, it's Dr. Fred, and welcome to The Healthy Healer. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about what is the point of the healthy healer? Like, why be healthy if you're a healer? Or why become a healer if you're already healthy? And we're going to look a little bit at the humanity, at the essence of what it means to even be a healer. And I decided uh, that I would take this opportunity to you know, bring open, bring to the open some ideas about both the words healthy and healer and see if this like resonates with some of you, my listeners. First of all, thank you so much for being a listener. Thank you for being a viewer of the Healthy Healer podcast. My name is Dr. Fred, and I would like to say that, you know, I've been a healer since I arrived on the planet like 65 years ago. And it's really been, uh, it's really been what what was called for for me. Like when I arrived to a family that was in a fair amount of disarray is what they tell me. Um, my two older brothers and my parents, uh, you know, my brothers were 10 and 14 years old respectively and there was a lot of discord and chaos. And my job was to bring pleasure uh, to, a, to a family like that or to bring maybe some form of organization or some form of levity or some form of love or communication and connection into that family. And so I hit the punch clock, you know, as I came out and have really been doing this my whole life. But I also really wanted to be a healer all the way through school. I was, uh, I was the person that my friends would, you know, call me and tell me their issues and tell me their problems. And then I would help them find solutions and see what I could do to help implement those solutions. And it's just someone that I've always been. And then in school, uh, that didn't work out so well uh, to become a healer. It seemed like what was really being asked of me was to regurgitate whatever the professors had to say and not to communicate effectively, which I learned when I was a child, and I still hold to it dearly, that at the heart of all healing is something called a human connection. I remember early on when I would watch my family speak from the playpen, and they would be connecting and I could see that there would be healing of some nature. I, you know, from whatever a three or four year old can see, I could see that good things happen with, you know, with excellent communication. And that's what I wanted to do was really be a communicator. And when school kept on sort of choking that out of what was expected to me of me as a student, I began to look for alternative ways to communicate. We only have one life and I just felt communication was so essential. So after the second time that I dropped out of college, uh, I came back home. My mom got me an application for um, a state mental health hospital where I could help be with uh, adolescent boys. <clears throat> that job was really eye-opening. It started in 1980. And in that job, I really learned how to be a healer. 
And what it was, was that I was being healed at the same time. I was learning that these were not diagnoses. These were not like unfortunate uh, afflicted people or sick people or ill people. These people that I'm, you know, the, the adolescents that I was speaking with each and every day. These were people who needed to be heard. These were people who loved to communicate well, using words or art or music or in many ways. We played in the gym. We took uh, field trips. We, um, you know, communicated together and connected. And in that process, they were healing. The thing I didn't like about that job was the way, you know, psychiatry, uh, the way psychiatry um, was actually functioning. And I decided that psychiatry was probably like the top of the chain of communication as a source for healing. My brother was a psychoanalyst already, uh, my oldest brother. And so, you know, there was like a, a, a path that was already forged into how to become a healer. I went back to school a third time, and this time I stuck in long enough to not only complete undergraduate school, but to then get accepted to medical school, complete my medical school degree in four years at the um, wonderful downtown Chicago Medical School at Northwestern University, and then to do an internship uh, also in Chicago, and then to move to Cincinnati and do a residency, and then to complete my education with a um, fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry, which of course was how I got started um, back in 1980. By that time, the field had changed drastically while I was in training. Paradigmatic shifts set in, and there was a new way of looking at psychiatry for which communication and human connection was not necessarily at the center of the healing. We were now looking at biological psychiatry or a, a, a psychiatry based on this a theory of chemical imbalances, meaning that when we were uncomfortable for whatever reason, that that was somehow on us and that we were expected to be comfortable. And when we were anxious, nervous, afraid, um, tired or sleepless or hopeless or um, confused or overwhelmed, that all of those things represented something called a, a mental illness over time, enough so that there was medications that were meant to deal with those deficiencies or those afflictions, uh, those diseases, those illnesses. I was not very aligned with that. Um, so I really, really got that there was a, um, a new, mm, a, a, that a new way of looking at this was required. Now, it didn't stop me from diagnosing thousands, even tens of thousands of people in my career. And then treating one way or another, multiple people with medications. I'm sure that I wrote over 100,000 prescriptions in my, uh, you know, my career that spanned, oh, well over three decades, 32, 33 years up until now. So the idea was that that wasn't healing. I didn't see that was even intended to be healing. As a psychiatrist, we no longer even considered healing. All we considered was the possibility of containment or slowing down what is otherwise a lifelong deteriorating process. Again, I didn't necessarily buy that concept either because what I really started to believe was that it is no such thing necessarily or not automatic anyways, that there is afflictions that get worse and worse over time psychiatrically. It is precisely in the diagnoses and often the treatment that creates a general sense of unhealthiness, like there's something wrong, something deficient, something missing, something inherently wrong with our humanity that then gets labeled and then, you know, with the hope of a good cocktail or a good diagnosis can be repaired. This wasn't my experience very often, and I was a pretty premier psychopharmacologist, so I started seeing that this was not a way to create healing or health. And about 2006, I started taking people off of medicine, people lower, I suppose the lower risk people, and lo and behold, they got better and reliably better and considerably better. So I was really excited about that, and we started to expand that into uh, a, a different crowd, the crowd that was a little less low risk, maybe a little riskier, like maybe on one or two medicines or had been on, you know, had conditions for a long time. And then lo and behold, they got better too. Sometimes so much better that they would rock their own system. People who expected them to say, stay sick, you know, and stay mumbly or confused or, you know, kind of zombied or 
incapable had the the system wasn't ready for them to launch into their new level of capability and their new level of energy because these uh, medications and diagnoses tend to be generally fairly blunting. So again, we fast forward a little bit to when I began to get that I can no longer really um, in good faith continue to diagnose people with afflictions that I didn't believe that they had. And then by the way, if you have an affliction and you have a disease, you have a mental illness that you're pretty sure that you have, this is not an endorsement that you uh, should change your ways. Uh, good for you if you have that disease and you recognize that the treatment for that disease has either saved your life or given you a life that works, I'm not here to alter that. This is for the hundreds of millions of people who do not meet that criteria, however. And it may be interesting to you if you do meet that criteria, but it won't be, this is not about you changing your ways if you have found something that works. Our goal in life is to find something that works. And if your diagnosis and your medication or your treatment or your therapy regimen is working for you, please, please, please continue that pathway. This is only for the group who either haven't found anything that works or are not happy with what their treatment is such that maybe they're even getting worse. And the idea of healing has uh, maybe been like um, eased out of the future possibility. So that's what's here is I really want to speak to that group and, 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 you know, everyone can listen, but that's what I have. So we start looking at what happened and Welcome to Humanity got created. This was my brand as uh, early as 2016 and 17, where uh, it's self-explanatory, like really looking at humanity as, you know, multi-dimensional and that feeling bad is not a, a disease and being scared is not a disease and being anxious, depressed, nervous is not a disease. Being um, uh, confused or overwhelmed or having insomnia, it's also not a disease. Having difficulty in social settings, not a disease. Um, you know, uh, having uh, difficulty responding to a recent trauma, uh, not a disease. Um, you know, uh, difficulty sitting still, not a disease. Not inherently anyways. Now, again, for those of you who are pretty sure that it is a disease for the person that you're speaking about, either yourself or someone you know or love, I'm not arguing with that. That's fine. It's just that those symptoms or those experiences in and of themselves do not declare or make a disease. It is only when we start seeing ourselves as disease and then maybe start taking medications or treatments that unfortunately often perpetuate the symptoms you're marketed to treat that we create problems. Because if we have a business model here that is actually perpetuating or causing the symptoms they're marketed to treat, we have a, a brilliant business model of a perpetual psychiatric or mental health patient. And there are so many of those people out there. What does it take to be a healer? Well, maybe those psychiatrists who have now been sort of typecast into being pill, they call them pill mills or, or you know, medication only therapists who do med checks and, uh, you know, uh, initial evals and med checks. And that's all that we're counted on for. You know, we check in with the client or the patient, but ultimately, if there's going to be talk therapy or if there's going to be real conversations, we expect that to happen with the uh, with the ancillary psychiatric staff, the, you know, the staff of um, therapists or social workers or, um, you know, psychologists who are trained for that purpose. But in the healer, in the healing, the healer, uh, and in the healthy healer, so my course is called Healing the Healer. The podcast, of course, is called The Healthy Healer. So one who's on their way to healing or one who's already really, really concerned and taking, taking every step to keep themselves healthy is what this is about. What is the healthy healer? In order to be an effective healer, you want your healer to at least be pursuing their own health. I don't have anything against unhealthy healers, but it's like going to someone who's fat and out of shape to be a personal trainer. It would be kind of silly or, you know, there, if someone doesn't know how to be, how to pay attention to their own health, then perhaps that's not the direction you need to go in order to explore or uh, what it means to be a healthy healer. So also, if you already are a healer, you want to take advantage of everything that it is that you say. You shouldn't be offering, I, in my world anyways, you should not be offering treatments that you wouldn't yourself be willing to do. 
And that includes medications. I mean, would you be willing to take the medications that you prescribe? Um, in most cases, many doctors would, you know, many psychiatrists and anyways, would not be willing to do that. You know, maybe antidepressants a little bit more often, and maybe an occasional benzodiazepine for some of us psychiatrists is seen as being okay. But I'm asking you something different, which is, would you um, be willing to take the medications in the same way that you offer them to your patients? Or, and if so, uh, uh, okay, and, and probably not so more often than not. And if not, what's the distance? What's the distance between you and your patients? The conversations that we're going to have in the Healthy Healer are conversations about uh, how to stay healthy, how to be healthy, what it means to be healthy as a healer. How is it that being a healthy healer is a, maybe a more effective approach than being an unhealthy healer? And then really the other piece, which is maybe a little less obvious, is the healthy person is already a healer. So let's say you're not officially a doctor, you're not officially in the field, but you really pursue your own health uh, with vigor, you know, with intensity, with intentionality. You're already a healer. For the people around you, they are touched by your healing self. They are touched by your healthy self. And that's part of this conversation as well. So the line gets drawn thinner and thinner between the world, words um, healthy and healer. In other words, the sooner you become healthy, the more likely you are to be a healer. And when you become a healer, it starts being an onus on you to take care of your own self and keep yourself healthy in every way possible. These are difficult times and the toxins that are out there in relationships or in the air, in the water, um, in our food, uh, what we hear, what we get to see, uh, all these things, there's toxins everywhere. And it's hard to stay well. Uh, it's hard to stay in balance, and there's multiple ways to do so, which don't necessarily include any pharmacological agents and definitely don't include a diagnosis that makes you wrong or bad or different than a normal person. The, heal, the, the healthy healer is an effort to shine a light on people who understand that in their own special way. We'll be interviewing doctors who are amazing, and this first interview that we have today is amazing. Uh, we'll be in, you know, that, that this is with um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Ibsen, who's just flat out incredible. And, you know, he's gone through his share of life. He's had his dips and his turns and his crashes and his rebirths. You know, he's had his um, his time off and his time on. He's had a focal point on him and also put focal points on others. He's looked at medicine from so many different angles that who he is in the world of being a doctor and being a healer sort of exemplifies what it is that I'm talking about here. Now, every day we have to be healing. Every day we have to pay attention to this. And some days, you know, I don't work out on some days or in other days I don't read or I don't write or I don't, maybe I even eat some food that mm, mm, uh, may be a little less than perfect. And that's probably true with you. Some of the key ingredients to being healthy is to accepting, forgiving and being patient with your own self. So, you know, having compassion, acceptance, forgiveness and the courage to actually bring those things forward having kindness, being gentle with yourself for all the things that you've done that you now think weren't very good. The object here is to remain a healer, even if you don't remain in medicine any longer. Many, many people are being pushed to the door a little bit, like, okay, do you still belong in the field? Maybe they're being uh, told that they no longer belong. Maybe they're misaligned now with the uh, practice that they're in. Maybe they're being fired or maybe they're quitting. But the idea is um, these people are also and remain healers because they were healers long before became doctors. This is a podcast that's going to be spending time looking at all that and all the intricacies that are involved. It is my deepest honor and my deepest pleasure to be hosting this podcast. Once a week, we will have amazing guest stars here. This week, it was Dr. Ibsen. Now... 
we will also have time later on in the week to have conversations like this, where we really start looking at topical aspects of what it means to be a healthy healer. Come along for the ride. I think you'll really enjoy it. If you're a healer, I'm so glad you're here. Totally honor that you're here. And the time is really to step up your game so that you can be even a better healer than you are now, if that can be imaginable. And if you're not exactly a healer, what I want you to get is, yes, you are, first of all. And yes, you can learn a lot. There's an education and an entertainment and inspirational component to this particular podcast that I think you'll find very enjoyable. So welcome to humanity, everyone, and welcome to The Healthy Healer. It's an honor. I'm Dr. Fred. It's really, really great to have you here, and we will catch you on the flip side. Thanks for being here for this, our inaugural week of The Healthy Healer. Bye for now. This is The Healthy Healer, where true voice is your medicine. This is where we help doctors and other healers navigate through the challenging times by learning from the best minds in the healing industry. Laugh, cry, and be surprised. It's entertainment, education, and inspiration so you can continue to be the unique and amazing healer you were destined to be. Welcome to humanity. Welcome to The Healthy Healer with Dr. Fred. Hello, everyone. So today... We have an amazing guest. Dr. Gigi Samed is someone I've met in the last couple months, and she's just so in tune. And she wasn't always that way. She went through a lot of changes. She got herself challenged and then challenged herself. She really came up with new ideas on how to be the doctor, how to be a healer, how to be someone to bring her very real self by not even really pretending to be anyone but who she was and taking assistance from the outside universe. Gigi is really aligned with herself now and has finally found a space where she is a real healer, a representative for women doctors, a representative for uh, alternative treatments, and a representative for just delivering the highest power of healing into the world that you know any of us could expect to receive. All of Gigi's work is now geared towards her own sense of healing and as educated as she is through her life experiences, uh, she becomes an extraordinary conversationalist. Enjoy the show. I really, really hope you will and expect that you will. It's just uh, awesome to interview Dr. Gigi Samet. Hello, everyone. It's Dr. Fred. And, um, you know, I am very excited to introduce you, uh, our, our guest, our special guest for today's show of The Healthy Healer. So um, Gigi Samed was introduced to me by a mutual friend who I deeply respect. And, you know, just the story goes that when he heard and started to learn a little bit more about what I was up to, he said, oh, there's just one person I need to have you meet as soon as possible. And he gave me Dr. Samed's uh, phone number. And we were able to connect and have a, a blisteringly fun conversation on the phone. And since then have had really uh, some good connections. It's very clear that we walk at least enough of a similar path to be able to work and play together into the future. So it was very easy for me to pick Gigi to be uh, an early guest on the uh, Healthy Healer podcast, because as I see it is uh, Gigi might in fact embody what it really means to be a healthy healer in these extremely challenging, difficult times. Um, we'll hear a little bit more about uh, how Dr. Samed got to be who she got to be here in a moment. And it's just uh, before we do so, I just want to acknowledge that the meeting that uh, was arranged by our mutual friend was spectacular. And sometimes we don't know when and how we're going to meet each other. But when we stand aligned with our very self, uh, the world tends to assist, the universe tends to conspire in our direction. And that Certainly is the case with Dr. Uh, uh, Gigi Samet and myself. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, you, my listening audience, to Gigi Samet. Hey, Gigi, good to see you. Hey, Fred, thank you so much for having me on. Um, yeah, so this is going to be fun because I know when we had our first conversation, we just sort of riffed and all of the synchronicities and the things that we've been through that we had in common was just, yeah, it's just fun. And I, and I love meeting other people healers and doctors who've gone through the world and learned to walk through it with their intuition and to see the magic and the miracles that we call synchronicity. So yeah, exactly. I'm excited. Yeah, we like to call it synchronicity and we even like to call it magic and miracles when in fact, what's really here is just the way the world goes. Um, you know, 
did you tell us a little bit about you know what you do i saw a really beautiful post for instance just uh, not more than an hour ago on linkedin and uh i think it really embodies a little bit at least a, a good part of your alter ego or maybe it's really your front edge tip of the sword ego uh of what it is and i don't mean ego in a negative way what it is that you do in a life uh at this point how you are a physician tell us a little bit a little bit about who you are as a physician right now yeah, so I, I've been an emergency medicine physician since 1998 when I finished my residency. So I finished med school in 95. And it's interesting because it's the, you know, the I am never changes, but the labels do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, what I would say I am at this point is I am a high priestess in a white coat who gets to serve God and love through medicine. And I had to come through, come to that. Um, it's been it's been quite the journey and the transformation. And I had to go through my own burnout and um, issues to get there, um, yeah. just to come back to who we are. It's like we spend the first half of our life adding labels and degrees to prove something. And the second half of our life, we try to take it all off to figure out who we are again and go back to simplicity. So exactly so that's a it's a pretty uh you know i hear everything you're saying and then you know this what what slips out of who i am today from you is this and i saw this in the in the linkedin uh uh post as well this high priestess in a white coat mm -hmm. and you know that seems like an interesting juxtaposition an interesting interface between being a priestess and wearing a white coat and i think you, you know you know you're you're playing on that line Tell us a little bit about what both of those things mean. What is a high priestess? What is wearing a white coat? What should we learn about you when we get those two things next to each other? I think the most important thing is that I've reconnected to my true core values. And, you know, whether it was being an 11 year old who just wanted to be the person that when I touched someone and laid hands on them, the pain would go away. Or the young girl that was starstruck by some guy named Jesus who could walk through a room and heal people and no one had to know his name um, to where I am now, which is really, for me, a high priestess is someone who serves others, not from a place of ego, but as a conduit. Mm -hmm. And I have always said that I just want to be a conduit for healing and grace on earth. I, I want to be love on two legs. And so for me, the high priestess part combines my heart my spirituality, the core values of connection and service, but also that fierce warrior part of me that as a doctor in a white coat will go toe to toe with anybody for my patients and for what they need to heal. And yeah, then the white coat part of it, of course, is I was like, okay, well, what do you call this? These amazing people who go out and help people. And it's like, oh, doctor, okay, I'll be that. Mm. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's interesting through the last 28 years, it's like, oh, there is healers in all professions. And the most amazing thing is to realize that the biggest healing I can give sometimes is just in my words and in my presence and in how I show up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Healing, healing people sometimes is just a matter of sharing the right words or listening at a level that only a few of us uh, get access to. And it sounds like you really have found that. Maybe there's not a level of mastery, um, but maybe there is. Maybe there's a level of being able to listen to people and listen to what is ailing or what is dis-ease or what is troubling or what is uh, what needs healing. Where can you provide a new level of balance? and? Again, as a conduit, it's almost like you need to count on somebody besides or something besides this self of yours to make those interventional decisions. Can say yeah. a little bit more about that. Oh, gosh. So, yeah, it's it's been a matter of tapping back into all the things we know, you know, as as a young girl growing up in a family that's math and science and, you know, that the irony of having grandparents who are very superstitious, but then growing up in a very math science family, it's like, nope, you got to stick with what you can prove. If I can't prove it, it didn't happen. Uh, and yet there were things that I always sensed or knew or things that I might see, but it's like, okay, that I can't prove that. So what do I do with that? 
And prior to going through burnout and addiction to Ambien, it was like, push all of that away. But I realized as I was getting closer to the burnout, I started seeking more spiritual. I mean, I went and studied with a Native American shaman in Arizona. I started, I became a Reiki master. I was like, I knew that there was something more than just the concrete black and white things we put on our degrees and our certifications. There's something missing. And I think the biggest thing I've done is just come home to myself and go, okay, I don't know how I know what I know, but I know it. And I trust it. Those things we call gut instincts, they've saved so many patients and I'm done fighting, you know, for science and math. And, and what I've come to is that magic and woo woo stuff is just the things science hasn't found an explanation for. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So you touch on a couple of things that for sure piqued the interest of our listeners. And I, I, uh, I know a little bit because you told me a little bit, but I'd love for you to touch, you know, go back to these uncomfortable experiences that were in the pathway. These stones or boulders that, you know, were like threaten your very nature at some point. Uh, this idea of burnout or being addicted to Ambien are not things that are uh, small potatoes. These are things that take people out and take people entirely off their course for the often for an entire lifetime. Somehow you've used these to your benefit. These, uh, this, this, we'll call it a a thread or, um, yeah, a continual a continuation between near burnout and then addiction to Ambien, and then who you get to be when you return. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, this concept of what was burnout for you, and what was this addiction mm -hmm. to Ambien? How the hell did you get on the other side of that? And yeah. Uh, you know, who are we really talking to when we get somebody who dealt with boulders at that level? Yeah, oh, that's that's a really great question. I still try to figure that out every day. And being a five-year-old on the inside, I just get to wake up and play and figure out who I am each day. So good luck trying to figure out who you're talking to on the other side. But here I am. Um, yeah, so the burnout for me showed up as a gradual increasing dissatisfaction and trying to prove myself. And And it's it's this thing. So a couple of things, you know, the, I wish they taught us these things. The seven year itch is what I call it. Yeah. And I'm like, it's not just in marriages. You wake up about seven years out of residency or medical school and you lift your head up and you go, how the heck did I get here? I mean, I know this is what they said I wanted. I know this is what I thought I wanted, but you get there and you're like, it still feels empty and dissatisfied. Or then you go from one practice to another going, I'm going to find the one that like fits and feels like my forever family. And I had this like naive, like I'm going to find the place and it's going to be home forever. And that just didn't exist. And so what I realized is I got, again, I joke that uh, the number of degrees I hold is inversely proportional to the low self-esteem that I had in trying to prove myself. Now, if you said that to me, I probably would have punched you in the face back then because yeah. me, low self-esteem, hell no. Right. Um, and the reality is, I think we all do that. We try to fill that growing dissatisfaction, something's missing with more labels, with more degrees, with new job titles, with a different practice. And wherever we go, there's still this sort of emptiness. And you said something earlier about the deep listening and and the giving people what they need. And the irony is through this journey, I've realized that you cannot listen deeply and you cannot be what people need and you cannot give them what they need until you actually pay attention to yourself. Good. And yeah. so the biggest thing for me is like, oh, I'm not just a conduit that gets to watch everyone else get what they need, but I I have to take care of myself first. Mm -hmm. And and it's not that we all need the same thing. For me, I need connection and I need service. So anyway, back to you know going through the burnout, it was extremely frustrating. I became a associate director at a level one trauma center for quality assurance. I became a medical director. I'm like, okay, I'll become chief medical officer. This isn't this the checkbox. This is the the path to fulfillment. And yet the more I did the more the imposter syndrome kicked in, the more the frustration of like, okay, I've done this, but now instead of feeling like I finally got there, I feel like I'm having to work harder to stay here. And it was all internal perception of, I got here, I got to prove I'm worth it, got to prove I'm good enough. Uh, and I never knew how to turn it off. 
and and they train us that way it's like okay i mean especially in the er we're trained everything is stat everything is life and death everything has to be done now 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 super stat as my friend used to say and the nervous system is constantly in fight or flight or the other two trauma responses which is to freeze or fawn fawning is the fourth trauma response which in a way I think most healers are really great at because we will be perfectionists. We will be achievers. We will, you know, you want me to do it differently, better? Yes, sir. So right. all of that led me to starting to use Ambien initially for night shifts. And then I got to be one of those uh, lovely first early adopter poster children for sleepwalking and sleep driving and sleep doing things that you don't know you did because you know I lived by myself so that ultimately escalated to where I went into withdrawal at work and you know this was in 2006 mm -hmm. when it first came out it wasn't it was not even a restricted drug no big deal you work night shifts here you go um you know, and I, I say that, you know, my drug dealers were all my colleagues I worked with for 10 years because they're like, oh, yeah, you need a prescription for Ambien. Here you go. Right. And, and I say that facetiously, obviously, but it it was too easy. And uh, eventually I went into <laughs> withdrawal um, at the end of a shift. I didn't actually make it through 12 hours. And I started I was nauseous. I was pouring sweat. I couldn't use one arm. I couldn't speak. They thought I was having a stroke and I was 36. And uh, I mean, spinal tap, MRI, you name it. And ultimately they found nothing. Of course they did a drug test clean because I don't do drugs. And back then Ambien wasn't, didn't even have a test for it. And uh, my director uh, came in and confronted me because he'd gotten reports from pharmacists that I was writing prescriptions for myself. And so there I was, December 23rd, 2006, on the back of an ambulance from my shift to a rehab facility against my will. Mm. And whoa. So, you know, to go from all of these titles and accolades to the shame and humiliation of being in a patient gown on the back of an ambulance for an unplanned trip just before Christmas was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like you said, it just, it, it was this great reset. Talk about ego, like ego death, like, oh, okay, this is who you thought you are. Let's strip away all the things you thought you are. Now, who are you? Exactly. Yeah, that's beautiful. You know, and 2006, as maybe some of my listeners know, was a similar, was a similar year for me. It was a turnaround year for me. I, I, uh, cringe at various things that happened to me in that particular year um a few months before you and in fact also in December of that year I had my own difficulties for sure and these turned out to be difficulties that really sent me down an entirely new path a path towards now becoming someone who indeed is disowned from the self that was promising and planning to do more and more and more in order to reach some level of uh, no, you know, some level of, I don't know, fame and fortune, or maybe really <laughs> to some level of satisfaction that was supposed to come if I climbed the ladder high enough. That really didn't uh, happen back then. So maybe this is what Adam was noticing when he when he had us meet um, that some somehow the similar patterns that we were along the way with. One of the things I'm really noticing here is that the um, what came across for you after the rehab stint was somehow to muscle ahead. I know for me, I had a moment in time, and it sounds like in 2007, would, you might have had the same moment where you could have dropped the ball. You could have just said, okay, that, I, you know what? Screw the shit. I'm going to go do something else. Um, but you did it. Like something, or maybe you did, and then you ease yourself back in. I'm not sure exactly how it went, but let's put you now post rehab, post sobriety, uh, you know, clean and uh, uh, clean and sober from Ambien or Sonata or whatever else you might've been taking. And uh, let's look a little bit at where does the decision then get made that being a healer is not only pursuable, but really critical in your future. Yeah. 
Uh, I think the biggest part of that was I actually surrendered my license to deal with the ambient addiction. Mm. <clears throat> I'd, you know, I'd get a month clean and then I'd go and I'd have all these prescriptions just waiting for me. And then I finally got three months clean and like a good addict brain, I thought, oh, well, now that I'm working again, night shifts, I haven't taken it in three months. I should be able to take just one. Yeah, responsible. <laughs> oh, of course. Typ typical addict brain is I got this. And uh, of course, I didn't got this. And, uh, you know, my, my line was, I will not take it if it's anywhere near a shift. Unfortunately, three days into my shifts, I went into withdrawal, had a seizure and woke up in the ICU of the um, ER where I'd been working. And that moment, there were a couple of things. First of all, waking back up in the ICU, I remember thinking, why God, <laughs> why did you send me back? Like, it would have been so easy to just let me stay. Even you didn't want me, what's going on? And I remember just that feeling of hopelessness. <clears throat> And then going through rehab and coming out the other side of it, because I surrendered my license to deal with it, I didn't realize then that I'd actually have to wait two years to get it back, even though, even though it was voluntary. And that was like, a, whoa. So there was this moment of like, what do you mean? I can't be a doctor again. And they're like, oh, no, it's not guaranteed. You've got it, you know, drug test, proof of sobriety for two years, and then you get to come before us. And during that time, it became a barista at Starbucks because I'm just, I cannot sit still and do nothing. You actually became a barista at Starbucks? I did. Do you know that that's like, that's like the actual backline joke of the entire course that I run? That's hilarious. I did not know about you, but the entire <laughs> he, Healing the Healer talks about barista at Starbucks on a number of occasions. So anyways, keep going. Well, yeah, so more synchronicities there. But I did. I became a barista at Starbucks. I needed something to get me out of the house. Uh, I needed something to, you know, just be a human being. And so that was actually a big part of my healing was to realize that even when I was serving coffee, I made a difference. And that everything I actually needed was in my heart, my head and my hands and was never in my white coat to begin with. And so it was this really great peeling away of the things that I thought I needed the white coat to validate in me. And they didn't. And, you know, to see people smile and to share their stories and they would be like, what, you're a doctor? Like, what are you doing making my coffee? And I was like, I didn't care. Like there was, it, it was such a beautiful way to strip away the ego of like, yes, I'm a doctor and I am your barista. So um, <clears throat> and it also gave me a lot of gratitude because I'm working with people who are baristas and may always be. And the other part was that I, you know, I was approached to maybe go up the chain of management to become, you know, a store manager. And I just said, no, thank you. Because being there, I realized that I actually love medicine. I love the honor and privilege that complete strangers, like, it just feels so humbling to have complete strangers walk in and trust me with their lives. Yeah. And trust me with their hearts. And, yeah. and I just, I think in that moment, I had a second dedication to it and it stripped away all of the anger and frustration. And, you know, as, as I was getting burnt out and dissatisfied, all I could see was drug seekers and all I could see was the system abusers and all I could see was the negatives. <clears throat> and I guess I needed to go through this separation with medicine to fall in love with it again. Mm -hmm. And also to see it as it really is without giving it all of the significance of what it made me that I was a doctor. Fantastic. So it's really, really phenomenal. There's like a redefinition or recontextualization that takes place in those years between 2006 and 2008, which of course were also the same two years that I indeed well, um, ha had my license challenge. I wasn't surrendered. I was probated. And, uh, you know, during those years, there was really an opportunity, it sounds like, for you to, you know, reset yourself. Like, you could have, you really could have. You could have become a district manager or maybe even owned a franchise or two or who knows. You know, you could have been barista priestess and, you know, you could have gone very, very high up the chain. 
The idea here is that you stopped and were able to look at the honor of what it means to be a healer or a physician. And when you come back, you come back with an entirely different skill set or an entirely different interest in what it's going to take to be an effective healer. That's what it feels like. Is that aligned with your reality as well? Yeah. I, and you know, to your point, I went and got my master's in business while I was a barista because I thought, well, what if I never become a doctor again? What what can I do with my skills? And when I went back into medicine, it was like, yeah, it was a it was a redefinition of medicine, but it was also a redefinition of myself. And part of it was that I've always been a seeker and I always want to understand. So I was like, okay, I want to know why the heck I sabotaged myself so spectacularly. And, you know, all of it, the, the parts of me that were in denial or the parts of me that I denied the being a woman in medicine, you know, especially back in 1998, I was the first female ER doctor at this hospital and you would have thought I was a zebra and it was like oh you know um so having to define a lot of things and let go of a lot of the labels and realize I no longer had things to prove but in order to do that I had to confront what like what was that I made more in one year as a doctor than my grandfather who was a janitor made in a lifetime with seven children and so there were a lot of core beliefs, I think, that unconscious, for example, that of course I sabotaged myself out of the money and went through bankruptcy and and lost the homes because, well, you know, now I'm being disloyal to my lineage and how can I exceed? And, and the guilt of having that kind of money with ease when my grandfather had to toil for it and, you know, literally give a shirt, the shirt off his back some days <clears throat> to keep his family clothed and fed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so a lot of it was redefining myself in the world and coming up against who was I actually trying to prove myself to? Because the reality is I thought I was frustrated with healthcare and I thought I was frustrated with the system, but the reality was I was suppressing so much insecurity, anxiety, trying to prove myself. That of course I had nothing left to deal with the system or to deal with the patients. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You had used up all your slack. You had used up the meat on the bone. It was not, <clears throat> you know, there really wasn't room for you to uh, throw what maybe what's left of yourself was only like, you know, some very small percentage of who you really were as a human because you were spending so much time dancing this other, maybe yeah. less, less authentic game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's subconscious, you know, that when I work with people, the, the biggest thing that surprises them is to realize where some of these things began. And so many times it's childhood, but mm -hmm. I, I liken it to if you're in the pool and you have a floaty and someone asks you to hold it underwater for a few minutes, no big deal. Hold it underwater for 10 minutes. It starts to be a little more hard. Try to hold it underwater for an hour. Well, try doing that for, oh, 10, 15 years. And all of a sudden, when it lets go, it's like, you're exhausted. You've got nothing left. And it just comes exploding out of the water one way or the other. And for me, that was the, I'm not good enough. That led me to be driven. That, you know, I, I also say that if you're driven, I used to think it was a really great thing, but it means someone else is driving. Yeah. And I was not driving my life. I was driven to perform, to you know, be good at what I did, but it all came from feeling like I needed to prove myself, whether it was to my dad or to whomever. And I think a lot of us have that where when something triggers us, you know, exa for example, my male colleague says something, it triggers me, but it's because I already believe within myself that I'm not good enough and I'm already having to try to work harder and to prove it. So how dare you? You know, whereas if someone says something to me now, it's like, eh, OK, that that's that's a you opinion and it doesn't change who I am. Yeah. One of the things I'm hearing, Gigi, it's really wonderful to hear you speak so candidly, rawly, openly. Thank you for doing that. And one of the things I'm really hearing is, uh, you know, that you've gone through a tremendous amount of growth and development and self-actualization, self-awareness 
you know, there's still, of course, work to do for all of us, but uh, you've now got a very nice 30,000 foot and from the inside out and a, a real, what sounds like, I'm sure not every minute of every day, but, you know, sounds like a, a leveled consciousness, a, a willingness to accept um, that, the, you know, the, the gifts that you have without taking credit for them or accept, uh, you know, accept who you are as a healer without um, needing to prove that to all these other folks that you're, uh, you know, that you're some form of big, a big shot. Like there's a new level of uh, self-awareness that's coming through here that m I imagine took some work or so took some travels. You can Reiki master or, you know, you were a, uh, you know, you did this North American shaman thing. Those are a couple examples. Can you talk to a little bit about what was your pathway to your own self-actualization I know that Starbucks barista was probably lots to do with it. And then you got the North American shaman and the, the Reiki master and others. Help us understand what took place after 2006 that got you to now know yourself so well. I would say the, the biggest thing was being willing to follow uh, whatever felt good. And I remember specifically <clears throat> making a vow to myself that I would never again neglect my soul to the point that I would it would have to sabotage me so spectacularly to get my attention. Because clearly I was getting warning signs that something was off long before it reached the burnout and the addiction. And so as part of that, it was really practice in letting go and practice in surrender, which is probably the most terrifying thing because Ironically, the most powerless people are the most controlling. And I was very controlling <laughs> before the burnout and the addiction. Uh, and so, for example, I found this medical intuitive. And, you know, her story was amazing. And she'd been an ER nurse for 16 years. And I was like, oh, and she could diagnose people from their aura. And I was like, okay, I'm willing to look into anything now. Like, no holds barred. I don't care. I'm following me. And, and so I, you know, I went to her seminars for almost five years. And I remember one of the biggest gifts, actually two of the biggest gifts she ever gave me. One was she said, true compassion comes from neutrality. And mm. I thought, what? Yeah, it's good. And up until that point, because I had suppressed so much of myself and because I was an empath and highly sensitive person, which I now know means I had a lot of trauma in my childhood, which just made me an empath and highly sensitive, um, I would lose myself. You know, if a patient was hurting, like my emotions would just be jerked around or, you know, I literally would cry if somebody died. And I still, to some degree, that's normal. And when I was so emotional, there was no room in the space for their emotions. And so it was a huge lesson of true compassion comes from neutrality and so okay well you say your highest value is service are you willing to serve and put your feelings and your ego aside and actually serve and create space for the patient mm -hmm. that was number one yeah. the second biggest gift she gave me was i remember we were in africa on safari and someone said to her how do you know when it's your intuition or it's your ego just telling you yeah yeah you like this go do it and she, uh, and she said, intuition is seven words or less, and it's always neutral. Now your reaction to the intuition that comes, <laughs> that's, that's usually emotional. But she's like, if it's more than seven words, it's probably your mind and your ego. And so it was practice. Uh, I, you know, it was like, okay, let me start feeling into this. I'm like, it, is it really that simple? Is it really this emotional GPS thing? You know, and then how do I reconcile that with, no, I'm in the ER. I need to be like logic mind, quick, quick, quick. And so what I've found is over the last years, now 13, 15 years, is the marriage of science and intuition has been that special breed of magic for me that makes it just lights me up. And truly, I think if you meet anyone who's done what they do for a long time and you become masterful at what you do, it really becomes almost thoughtless. So if you've ever read um, Malcolm Gladwell, I love his books, yeah. Blink. 
And I think in Blink, he talks about how we make these decisions in a split second that when you go back and figure out why you made that decision, you actually have like 20, 30 data points. But because you're so used to doing it, you made all of that integrated in a blink. And so, you know, bringing the intuition, bringing the soul, bringing the spirit, bringing the the trust that, oh, I felt the nudge to say this to this patient. That might be weird. And then I say it and they start crying and they're like, oh, my God, that's exactly how did, did you know that? Or what? I'm like, I didn't know that, but I just followed that nudge. So anyone who's ever been a master, if you've ever been in the flow like when you're really in flow and time flies, you're not thinking. Yeah. But you're doing, but that is that is the perfect marriage of the intuitive and the logic, which is when you're in flow. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Amazing. So the, uh, you know, that is, you you now get to say something like that with a, with a fair degree of emphasis. You get to say that as if it, at least for now, sits as very true. Let flow, you know, flow can be defined as such. Um, the, uh, you know, I am, this idea of giving yourself compassion or, or this idea of seven words or less. I'm trying to think of sentences that are seven words or less. Cause if I, even a sentence like, um, I came here to be a doctor. At seven, mm -hmm. it's already we filled up that we filled up the slots with that with that sentence. Um, is that what you know? What what happens is that when you know? And I think I did. By the way, I came here to be a healer. I I like that. I like that at seven. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah, that's that's right actually. <clears throat> um, and I wonder, do you have something that's seven words uh, or less that? then um paved the way for one of the one of the uh sec you know one of the segments of your way of being afterwards do you have a, a line that's yeah words or less? I, I don't because it's the those things come from the mind with the intuition it's typically just in the moments when i create space and i'm just being for well, in, in her case, she said, if you have a question, something you're wanting to do, you get neutral, you get centered, then you ask the question, and then you wait to hear the response or feel the response or sense the response, whatever it is. And I remember, for example, again, when she taught us this, I was in Africa, and I said, uh, and I just closed my eyes. And in my mind, I just said, am I meant to move to California? Mm. And I, I held I heard felt sense to one word no mm -hmm. and I was like what so for me the way I use that seven words or less is when I'm truly needing guidance or I'm not sure which way to go I just get quiet and wait to hear the the answer or feel the answer and if I'm not sure then I don't move so it's like if if no answer is an answer until you get a clear answer but I don't have a seven word. Well, you, uh, you might. Let me help you with it. It's like, get mm. quiet and wait for an answer. There you go. Yeah. Get quiet and wait. That's uh, that's less than seven. There, that's mm -hmm. a good one. Yeah. Beautiful. And what is the, uh, you know, you have so many great stories and I, I you know, you really do. I, you're, uh, it's uh riveting to say the least some of your stories i'd love for you to tell us a story that's even coming to mind as you speak now perhaps speaking to this intuition or this willingness to quiet even on the back end of i mean after all what state do you live in california okay so we're <laughs> gonna have to reconcile that here uh, <laughs> uh because uh you know mm -hmm. the voice told you you don't belong here and there you are mm -hmm. so Help us understand a little bit here yeah. in the next few minutes, some cool stories that you know are kind of, we were way the hell out there. Yeah. So at that time, I was not meant to move to California. And this um, intuitive asked me to come to Idaho, to Sun Valley. To Sun Valley. Yep. To be the medical director for a healing center where she would bring multiple modalities together. And my initial instinct was like, heck no, I don't want to go to Idaho from Georgia. 
Uh, and yet bouncing around in Africa, I also didn't want to be one of those people that just follows their guru. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. And yet it just kept bothering me. I was like, why? Like, okay, fine. So I got neutral. I closed my eyes and I was like, am I supposed to move to Sun Valley? And I got one word. Yes. Now, immediately after the yes, I was like, what the? Nope. I ignored that. And within three or four months, I had, at that point, I had become a business partner in a democratic ER group, which is, you know, unheard of and it's amazing. And so I had rebuilt things and I thought, there's no way in heck I'm going to leave all that behind. People are going to think I'm high and back on Ambien uh, to move to, you know, Idaho, potato land. What? So I ignored it. But within three or four months, everything at work became really hectic my partners, there was some passive aggressive, like what? And so here I am four months later in Idaho of all places at another, you know, workshop she's giving. And she looks at me and says, how's your move to Idaho coming? And how, cause she knew I'd gotten a yes answer. And I was like, oh man, in that moment, it dropped in for me that I had taken an oath not to ever ignore my soul's directions. And I had said, if you, you know, God, if you give me guidance, I'll follow it. And here I was, I've been given guidance and I was like, nope, not doing it. And so that night I went back up to my hotel room. I sent an email to my partners, you know, and said, I'm resigning as of, and here's my 120 day notice. And I was terrified. And the crazy thing is I got back to Georgia and all of a sudden everything at work was like hunky dory again. And I was like, oh, that's right the universe will kick my ass until I do what I promised to do. And now it, it's not all easy and peaches and roses. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I, a week and a half, two weeks later, I'm driving home from a shift and I'm just crying and bawling my eyes out going, am I really going to do this? This is insane. You know? And I was like, okay, God, please. Like, if this is really you and not just me, show, give me a sign. And I go out to my mailbox, I get out of the car, you know, it's the apartment mailbox and I open the the thing and literally the tears, I will never forget, are not even wet. They're not even dry in my face. The tears are still wet. And I open an envelope and it's a check for just over $10,000. And I'm like, huh? And I was like, if that's not a sign and an immediate answer. And then the craziness of finding out that it was from 18 years prior Right. When I was an intern, they had withheld three thousand dollars too much. And then over the years, it had become over ten thousand. Right. And that the government made them pay it back and they tracked me down. Right. 18 years later. And I was just like mind blown. Yeah. I remember my accountant said to me, you need to frame that. Two days later, I got a second one for twenty thousand dollars and mm-hmm. here i had been saying god how am i going to do this i'm still rebuilding after the bankruptcy i don't have money for the move and it was like boom you are definitely meant to move yeah and so that's literally how you know so i ended up in idaho and then two years later i'm flying back from georgia where i've been working locums and you know this is amazing because basically i thought i was going to idaho to become medical director of this facility that never um, materialized. But what happened is basically it was the universe's way of popping me out of the rat race because until then I didn't know that I could live in one place and work in another. I mean, my, my group was like, we love you. We want you to come back and work with us. And I said, well, okay, you can pay me an extra 30%, you know, your pay raise or pay for my travel thinking for sure they'll just pay for travel. No, they gave me the 30% pay raise. I was like, what? And because of that, I was able to live in Sun Valley, work six days a month, rack up hotel points and miles and, you know, just have this amazing life and go do all these things that were, I never would have done if I were still in the rat race. So that's, that's just one of the woo woo crazy stories. And, and I, I live that way now. Yeah. And, you know, it shows, it shows, it shows that you're both surrendered and powerful. So you're powerless and powerful, you know, you're, you have an access to um, your helpers, you know, the the helpers that aren't you, Uh, not only the helpers, the guides, the, 
uh, di the directional creators for you. And, you know, this idea of you swearing never, never to cross them uh, it seems to be working out. It's like you actually have a life that is uh, aligned with your soul, uh, that you can get things done that perhaps most people can only dream of, that you do have a blessed life. Yeah, and and the blessing is that I see all of it now as a blessing, and you know that addiction was the worst thing, and it was the best thing. It was, and now I realize that no matter what happens to me, all I have to ask is, what will I say five years from now was the best thing about this, mm -hmm. and it automatically switches things around. Beautiful. Well, Gigi, we could keep talking, you know that, and we will keep talking and, and you know, off air, but um, we do have to uh, kind of uh, taper this one down now. Um, if you had one thing to say to our listeners, and many of them might be doctors who are wondering why the hell this isn't working like they hoped it would, or um, or wondering what, what what is their future like so that they can be more aligned with who they are as a healer, might you give, what if you were able to give a sentence or two of a of a uh, recommendation, uh, given who you are now as an emeritus or e even as a pr high priestess, um, what might that be? I would say stop living a life of slow suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, I would never have committed suicide, but I knew that there were days I would have been just fine if I didn't wake up. So stop settling, stop accepting, stop living a life of, des of like desperation. And if you are feeling frustrated, it's because you know that you're living a B plus life and everybody else is applauding you as if you're living your A plus life. Beautiful. Yeah. So look at what, where are you settling and start there. Fantastic. Really great. Uh, you know, this is what we're here to talk about exactly. I know you weren't entirely certain of the topics that whether or not we could really capture the essence of what uh, the healthy healer or the course, the healing the healer course really is intended for, but you've done a, no one's ever going to do a better job than what you just did, Gigi. So thank you so much for being on the show. How do, how do, um, you know, there's going to be some people who listen to this who want to follow you or learn from you or like ask you questions or see what kind of food you're posting on uh, Instagram. What, what, how might they find you? Uh, so uh, the website is www drgigisamed.com so www.drgigisamed.com and the Instagram is also at drgigisamed so same thing drgigisamed drop me a Facebook message Instagram whatever I am always here and you know I I do master classes from time to time uh, to teach people the drive behind their driven and I also do some called soul medicine for the driven woman physician. And I just, I love people. I love, I love playing. I love creating. You do. You do. I love your love and your playing and your creating. It's super cool. Thanks for those five positive vibrations. Thanks for uh, downing yourself on the show. It's really been great to see you and to have this conversation with you. Folks, that was Dr. Gigi Samed, and it's just been an honor. I just feel like, you know, my future uh, has also been set in a new level of alignment as I now get to interview or present to you, my listeners, uh, people who have gone through it, people who have lived a life, people who are uh, facing challenges just like you and I are, and who have found a way to make their life work or on the way to finding their way to make their life work. And that's what the Healthy Healer is all about. So thanks for stopping in. Thanks for listening. Um, and we will catch you in the next episode. We're two times a week. One time a week we interview and one time a week you get to hear from me about anything that might be going on in the world that week. And so we'll catch you on the flip side. Gigi, thanks again for being a guest. You were wonderful. We'll catch you on the flip side as well. Thanks, Dr. Brad. Folks, wasn't that just amazing? Dr. Samad has been through a life, right? And there she is now uh, calling herself the high priestess uh with a white coat and you know she actually went through that interchange of leaving medicine and then getting an opportunity not only to hopefully heal herself but then to take that healing and move it into a newly contextualized newly reconstructed way of how to be a doctor and how to be a healer how to be even take advantage of being a shaman uh of getting um you know alternative 
uh, treatments and really stepping into her emergency room work where right now she is just an exquisite example of a healer who's doing what's right for the world. Uh, each of us can learn from someone like Dr. Samed about how to step into a life that really works. And as she says, in the end, really no longer needing to live a life of slow suicide. Dr. Gigi doesn't live a life of slow suicide. And for that reason, the conversation that we had was just simply educational, entertaining, and deeply inspiring. What a gift it was. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you did, it'd be awesome if you could kind of just give us a, you know, share this with others or give us a like. It goes a long way to putting this podcast out there to the people, the other clinicians, and maybe people who know other clinicians or who are being treated by other clinicians who are finding themselves ready to align themselves with their healing skills. Thank you so much for listening. We will catch you on the flip side. Bye for now. I'm out to alter the conversation about mental illness on a global scale. One of the things that I've been working with recently is the notion that mental illness and in fact mental health are just conversations. One of the things that I'm noticing that can be really helpful for people is to get that humanity comes with a whole array of experiences all the way from being in deep misery to being in complete ecstasy. And once you get that going on for yourself, you can start seeing that the disease model may not fit or may not have to fit as a way of looking at mental distress. What I plan to do is not use medication and not use diagnosis. And again, assist people to learn a new way of looking at this condition and look at a new way of looking at their symptoms so that they can feel empowered moving forward. There is the possibility of creating a way of being almost immediately that is different than what you have now, a transformation per se, a way of looking at one's own experience as not being mentally ill, but being part of humanity such that one can leave a conversation in a way that they had never ever seen themselves as being able to be before. I can't think of a single psychiatric complaint to which the response, welcome to humanity, is inappropriate. My purpose is to alter the conversation about mental illness on a global scale. The larger goal of the work that I'm doing is to reframe and alter the conversation of mental illness on a global scale. Over the last 100 years, the one-to-one -one model coming in and being seen by one person, one person at a time, is the model that's been utilized. This isn't the only model that works anymore. We are societal beings. We are communicative beings. And in fact, when we're with more than one person, we can learn and we can transform. And because one-to-one -one isn't the only workable model, I can impact a great number of people in speaking, consulting, and advising positions that otherwise were thought to not be able to have the simple, intimate effect that a one-to-one -one relationship does. One of the big questions we have is, what is mental illness? What is normalcy? And both of these things are entirely unclear and vague. As a role of consultant, my job is to listen and to provide new possibilities for the people who are having areas of life where they're stopped or where they're simply in a quandary. In the world of speaking, one of the things I bring forth is the process of inquiry. And what I mean by that is, if we get to an answer, we've actually gotten off the road. What we move forward with is asking questions, asking questions, creating new possibilities, moving forward into creating new ways of looking at things that otherwise we thought we had answers to. Another thing about being a public speaker is someone raises their hand and shares, whether it be a question or an area in life that they're working with. Oftentimes, many people, 20 or 30 other people in the room are sharing the exact same concerns. So this person becomes a spokesman for all these other people in the room and in the speaking and in the interaction, new ways of being emerge. Sometimes people will attend places where I'm speaking or where I'm consulting, and it won't be about them. It'll be about someone they know, someone in their family, a friend, someone that they're concerned about with respect to mental illness. Looking at different ways of exploring this notion of mental illness and exploring new ways of creating freedom, self-expression, and creativity. If you're involved with an organization and this is interesting to you, 
please reach out to me. If it's a good match, I'm available to speak to a group of any size from two to a thousand when you realize that mental illness isn't something that actually exists as you thought it was. Instantaneous transformation is actually available. Hi, this is Dr. Fred, and I am so excited to share with you my brand new podcast called Welcome to Humanity, where we explore together the human experience. This is the show that looks at what it means to be human and how to live an even more extraordinary life than the one we're already living. We do this through in-depth conversations with some of the most fascinating humans I have ever met on this planet. And as a psychiatrist and mental health worker, as well as a world citizen who's traveled the US and the world abroad, you can be sure I really have come across many fascinating people. Each guest provides a powerful case study, if you will, of what it means to live an extraordinary life. You walk away from these conversations enlightened and inspired and ready to make an impact in your world. The first 12 episodes will drop on Wednesday, May 20th, with new episodes releasing every Wednesday afterward. We call them Welcome to Humanity Wednesdays. On the very first episode, you'll meet Sarah Safari, a petite young woman who set an audacious goal to climb Mount Everest, despite the fact that she didn't even own a pair of hiking boots and had never even been camping. Just wait until you hear what Sarah faced when she found herself at the Kumbu Ice Falls, one of the most dangerous parts of the climb. It's truly a miracle that she's even here to tell us about it. And Everest is just the start of Sarah's remarkable journey. You can hear my entire conversation with Sarah Safari and 11 more incredible binge-worthy interviews. It all starts on Wednesday, May 20th on the Welcome to Humanity podcast. Check out a sneak peek episode at welcometohumanity.net forward slash podcast. Welcome to the show. Welcome to your life. Welcome to humanity. This is the Welcome to Humanity podcast with thought leader and transformative psychiatrist, Dr. Fred Moss. This show focuses on the betterment of humanity on a global scale. Each episode will leave you enlightened, inspired, and ready to make an impact in your world. Welcome to the show. Welcome to your life. Welcome to humanity. Here's Dr. Fred. Despite what you have just been told, I am not, in fact, Dr. Fred Moss, although he is here with me and I will be introducing him to you momentarily. So who am I? Who is this voice that is bleeding into your earbuds right now? My name is Ryan Levesque, and I am a veteran podcaster myself and the producer of this podcast, along with my friend and colleague, Dr. Fred Moss. So who is Dr. Fred? What is the welcome? to Humanity podcast. To answer those questions, I would like to formally introduce Dr. Fred to you now. So welcome, Dr. Fred, to your own podcast. It's really, really, really a pleasure to be on my own podcast as a guest. Thank you so much, Ryan. <laughs> it is awesome to have you here. And Dr. Fred, we've been working on this for a few months now. We've been talking about it for a lot longer than that as a possibility. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have put together just an incredible set of interviews to launch this show and uh, before we talk about that at all, why don't we just kind of get out of the way what uh, our listeners will hear will be one of the first orders of business, letting the audience get to hear a little bit from the guest and uh, hear who they are. So would you do us the honors of introducing yourself to the audience? Who is Dr. Fred? Yeah, thank you. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in. So yeah, my name is Dr. Fred Moss. Fred Moss is how I, you know, that's who I was started off as. And I've been in this mental health field for a bit over 40 years, you know, started with the field in January of 1980. And I was so committed, even as I look back to then, to connecting with others and communicating with others as a source of healing. 
I had dropped out of college because it wasn't happening there. And I, my mother got me a job in mental health. And I just began there as a child care worker and was really where I learned that communication and connection is so sourceful in any healing mechanism. And so what happened was after a few years, I really saw that I thought I could be a, a even better doctor than I watched the doctors be with the kids I was taking care of. And so off back to medical school, I went. And then um, before too long, I created a career as a really a, a psychiatrist in every single arena of psychiatry that I could find, I got a little taste of. And interviewing people and being with people and really getting the best out of people and learning from others who they were and like being someone who can inspire people at times, but it, it, maybe more than anything else, Ryan, what I, what I like to think I do is really get down to the source of who other people are. And that's who the source of I am is getting down to the source of who other people are. So the idea of a podcast you know, has always been really interesting for me to interview interesting people around the world. And in this case, to not only interview them for myself and them, but to be able to broadcast it to all interested parties is something that's been fascinating, interesting. And I'm, it's just glorious to be at this point in my life to be able to deliver that kind of work into the airwaves. And deliver it in spades, you do, Dr. Fred. I thought maybe to frame the conversation of what is the Welcome to Humanity podcast, uh, perhaps we could talk a little bit about what makes this show different than all of the other hundreds and thousands of podcasts out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came up a list of, of about three things that distinguish the Welcome to Humanity podcast. And the first, of course, is the host, you. Uh, there are lots of interview shows out there, but there's only one interview show with Dr. Fred as the host. And of course, part of that is the distinction of you being a psychiatrist with, uh, as you said, a long career in the mental health field. But I think there's some other, beyond just your actual professional training, some other skills that you bring to each conversation. And maybe you could say a word about that, Dr. Fred. First of all, I don't know where I'm unique um, entirely because I've actually been with me the entire run of my <laughs> life so far. So I don't really see what part of me stands out when compared to others as well as maybe you do. But one thing is, is really clear is I've been just so curious about people for so long. There's just always been something about really getting to one's truth and getting to one's goodness and, you know, getting to the bottom of what people are like taking them with me to the bottom of who they are. And it actually dictated my interest in going into the mental health field. It's who I was when I was in high school. It's who I was for my girlfriends and my boyfriends. You know, they would call me and we would take them in conversations to where they thought mm, the interest lied or where they thought the issue was or where they thought the problem was or where they thought the the dream was. And I feel like I've been sort of naturally put on this planet to be that kind of person. So you're right. It's not psychiatry that dictates who I was or who I am. It's quite the opposite. Who I am then dictated me to go into the mental health sharing field. And in the meantime, I found myself being a vagabond in much of my life, you know, in the last 10 years anyways, you know, being all over the world. I've been in Europe and I've um, been in Israel and I've been... I, I think in every state in the country, I'm pretty sure that I've been in every continental state in the country, at least for a short while. And I've lived in multiple different places. And it's really been great to be able to continue to be a psychiatrist while I was traveling. And for the last 10 years, of course, been, most of that has been through the world of telepsychiatry or virtual psychiatry, online right. psychiatry. Interviewing people online and interviewing people on the telephone is nothing new to me. It's actually something that's where I'm in my home base, where I feel most free and easy, like we're doing today. And maybe that comes out in the capacity of who I get to be when I'm interviewing my terrific guests. I'm sure looking forward to all the people that we're going to interview in the Welcome to Humanity podcast. You know, I think that ability to interview people or that experience of interviewing people, you've learned to kind of get to the heart of the matter with people and quickly get past the surface and into some of the deeper issues or concerns or realities. And that 
really leads to our second point, which is about the format of this podcast. Now, when we first sat down and started planning out what the show was going to look like, we were pretty clear on the fact that if we did a short show format, say with 10 to 15 minute episodes, maybe 20 minutes at the most, we might get more downloads and listens and that could position our, us to climb the charts mm -hmm. a bit more quickly. But we decided to choose a format that really served the interests of what we're all about, of what Welcome to Humanity is all about. Um, so do you want to say a little bit about the format of the show and why we, uh, what the long form format allows for here? Sure. Thank you for pointing that out as well. I think I'm going to circle back a little bit to the end of the last question. I think what we have here is in the Welcome to Humanity brand, it's really, you know, we worked hard to come up with that that name. And uh, what, what is what are we really doing? And And one of the things we're doing is we're really getting that, you know, each and every human is spectacular, each and every human in and of themselves. And I mean, each and every one is fully spectacular, fully creative, fully available in some ways to communicate with and has something to offer to the planet. And I really mean that to my core, you know, and so I used to and I've worked in um, homeless shelters and I've worked in very well-to-do neighborhoods. I've worked with the worried well. I've worked in prisons and I've worked in homeless shelters, like I said, or worked in orphanages and methadone clinics and residential homes, inpatient units and outpatient units and nursing homes and mobile crisis teams and even done my share of uh, house calls. And each and every one of those sort of brings forth something like really getting the person that's in front of me is a real person, not only a real person, but one who needs to be respected at the very highest level for being the person that they have become and the person who they are when I meet them. Mm. And I've been so fascinated with that, that there is nobody who's like more interesting or more important than any other person inherently. I mean, we draw, we draw conversations together. We create a prevailing conversation that puts maybe some people more interesting or more iconic or more famous or more maybe worth listening to or something. But in reality, I don't have it that way. I have it that with another person, one can dig to the gold and get there very, very quickly, as long as one appreciates that it's there to be gotten. And I treat each and every person, or I like to think that I treat each and every person to that effect. And I think that's what comes forth in the interviews. Maybe that's something that, you, that I'm fairly uniquely qualified for. Having hung out around in the streets or in the prisons or in, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm an MD, I'm a Northwestern graduate. And so I've even, you know, hung around with the well-to-do and hung around with, uh, you know, those who are at least materialistically comfortable. And um, I feel just as comfortable in the streets as I do in, you know, a mansion or in a country club. And I think that comes through in my interviewing style. So when we go to the format question, I think what, what I would have to say to that is, you know, within 10 minutes, at least that's been our case so far with the 20 or so that we've done, we're into the gold already. We're into some really, mm. really fresh material quite quickly. And then given that my guest tends to be very comfortable exploring their own selves in my presence, because that is what we're doing is highlighting the guests, the miracle of the guests that we have on our show. Then I sort of hold the hand of my guest as they walk me through what it means to be them. And there's nothing more fun for me, you know, there's truly nothing more interesting in the world. I, the whole world stops when I start doing these podcasts, Ryan. Mm, yeah. Well, you know, Dr. Fred, that realizing as we're talking about this, we've sort of, with my guidance, buried the lead here <laughs> in terms mm -hmm. of what the show is really about. And we've mentioned this title of the Welcome to Humanity podcast several times now, but we've kind of just left that out there without much context or explanation, although you've certainly just hinted at it, or maybe even more than hinted at it. Let's talk about the content. You know, we've got lots of different types of guests and I'll I'll ask you in a moment maybe to share a few words about some of the guests that stand out for you. But for now, what does it mean to look at the world or look at our guests through the prism of Welcome to Humanity? What is Welcome to Humanity all about? Right. Um, what what are we trying to do here? We went back and forth, as you know, um, with the name of this podcast. And there are two brands that we juggle together. And the, over, the umbrella, the overarching umbrella brand is the Welcome to Humanity brand. 
we started off considering that the brand for this podcast should be Global Madness. And right. You know, the Global Madness is a it's a great catchy name and it really is sort of the days that we're living in and maybe the days that humanity's been in since the beginning of time, actually, this idea of global madness. And then, you know, we had this lockdown and the lockdown happened right as we were starting. Right as, you know, we had done just a handful of interviews and then the lockdown happened and it seemed like global madness became really the normal reality of our life. And so yeah. we upgraded the name to Welcome to Humanity again, which is more sourceful for what we're up to here. We really get a look at these interviews of some of the most amazing people I've ever met. And I really think that every single person you bring on or that we bring on to this podcast is going to be an amazing person that we haven't met yet, because that's how the podcast is delivered. What I'm suggesting here is maybe that person or other people don't yet know that this is one of the most amazing people that you've ever met. And in the interviewing style or in the interchange, in the interactive way that the podcast is intended to be developed, what we've learned quite quickly is the person who's on the other side of this podcast is an extraordinary human being. And that's what I like to bring forth. And that's where we really get to say to each other something like, wow, that person is extraordinary. That person is up to this and up to that. And I think it also brings the possibility for the listener to seeing uh, how extraordinary they are as a listener and what they're really up to in their life, in their miracle of their own humanity. So Dr. Fred, I, I want to ask you this question, and I realize I'm wading into a little bit of treacherous territory here. <laughs> we're um, we're going to be launching with a dozen episodes. And I want to ask you to share maybe just a, a few examples of some of the episodes that stand out to you. And I know that's a dangerous request because obviously all 12 of them are really, really great. And we don't want to leave anyone out. On the other hand, we only have so much time here just to give listeners a taste. So if you will, chosen either by those that appeal to you the most strongly or just at random, what pops up in your mind, can you uh, share a few things that, that get covered or some of the people that we meet in the first 12 episodes? Sure. Well, I, the first thing I want to say is you're right. We've actually done 18 episodes. And so by the time even this is being aired, we'll probably be up closer to 25 or 30 episodes completed. And so these are the 12 people that got chosen because they were easy to edit and they were the ones who were here to be had. So let's make that really notable. There's Sarah Safari. So Sarah, Sarah is the one who opens us up and she was the first interview we did. And, you know, Sarah is an excellent, just a terrific example of what it is to be a, an amazing human being and be sort of unassuming and so, so much like any of us, you know, and, you know, and on first glance, Sarah Safari is just a, a person, you know, just a person with a gorgeous smile and a person with a brilliant curiosity and soft spoken and, you know, somehow probably making it through the world one way or another. And then we start learning about the magic that she is. We start learning about who she is in the world and all the, the many things that she stands for and some of the most amazing things she's already done with her life. For instance, climbing all the peaks, all the top peaks in all seven continents. And the only one left for her to climb is actually the one that was the first one she tried to climb. And she was involved in an extraordinary avalanche up. Mount Everest. <laughs> mm. There's not that many people who get to say that they were like lost in an avalanche for a week in Mount Everest. And right. she was. And, and, and you start really realizing that that was what launched her career. That didn't stop her. That's actually what launched her. And we start seeing, I know for, for me, I start seeing parts of myself where I've just been so determined to get stuff done that I'd be knocked to the mat or discouraged or maybe not an avalanche in Everest, but you know, something would happen where I would think, oh, maybe I need to stop. And then I would find myself even going with greater guns. So I was really able to see myself in the interview with Sarah. That would be one really prime example of an excellent, an excellent guest interview that we had. Yeah. And of course, Sarah does lead off our series of the first 12 as the very first, uh, as you said, Dr. Fred, not only the very first interview that we conducted for this podcast, but also the one that's leading us off here as we roll out the podcast. Did you want to say a word about another interview or two? Sure. Sure. You know, and I, I have gotten 
<clears throat> a little bit closer with a bunch of people who are up to some major things in the world regarding the transformation of the narrative of mental health on a global scale. Um, one of those people is the writer for Mad in America, the creator of Mad in America, also well known for a book that he wrote called The Anatomy of an Epidemic. So Robert Whitaker joined us and what an amazing person he is to just taking a stand for really looking clearly and, and plainly down the barrel of this industry called mental illness and mental health over the last 50 or 80 years. And, you know, we've been friends for a couple of years now as he's become sort of a fan of what I'm up to with respect to global madness and, and welcome to humanity. And it was just so beautiful to have the calm and courageous conversation with him as a colleague, really walking through uh, some of the things that we either know or think we know or don't know about mental illness and the you know different directions that that whole conversation might take in the near future to the betterment of all of mankind. So really, that was also a super, super rewarding conversation. For sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, it really was. And then uh, most recently, another writer, uh, Lawrence Gonzalez. Yeah, he's the writer of Deep Survival. And that I just completed that book. And sure enough, right upon completing the book, here was the writer. And I got to speak to the writer of the book that I had just completed. I'd never really had done that before. But there was a real opportunity to get to the heart of the matter of this man who explains why survivors survive. I guess that's an interesting crossover to Sarah. How is it that she survived that? What kind of skills or what kind of attributes or what kind of luck or what kind of aspects of humanity have one face the traumas of a natural disaster or an accident and actually live through it and thrive? And those are some of the things that Lawrence Gonzalez addressed in his book and then so openly and beautifully in the conversation we had just last week. Now, I don't think he's in the original 12. Or is he in the original? He is, yeah. Yep, yeah, okay, he's good. in the first 12. Good. And and then, you know, there was others. My good friend, Michael Galb, just an ex, just a wildly hilarious, extraordinary human being who's up to so many things. And then from those so many things gets up to even more things. So it's really, really fun to interview friends. It seems like all these people are my friends or they become my friends permanently upon interviewing in this podcast broadcast. So Michael's a, you know, a super fun interview. I think people will find a whole lot of themselves, you know, again, you, you can, you can separate yourself from some of these people and think that you're not like them, but as you listen closely to them, you can discover something for yourself right through your listening of them. Because what you get is that we are all human. We are one, we are one group of entities called humanity. And when we get this, if you can get the spectacular nature of other people, it's because it's in, in you, the listener as well. And may, that may be one of the things that we're really targeting in the creation of the Welcome to Humanity podcast, I think, Ryan. Mm, I, I love that, Dr. Fred. I, and I think that really is the opportunity here. You know, you could look across the list of guests on the various episodes, and there's in some cases a pretty wide diversity among different careers and interests. And there may be some on there that you think like, oh, geez, for example, to go back to Sarah Safari again, well, I'm never going to climb Mount Everest. So what's what's the point in listening to that one? <laughs> but besides mm -hmm. just the wild tale that she shares and the incredible journey, it's like there's that saying, success leaves clues. And right. throughout each of these interviews, we're getting clues and perspectives and approaches and tools for living as humans on this third rock from the sun and uh, not just living, but flourishing and living extraordinary lives. Indeed. And, and, you know, when I look at the list of the 12 people and it is in front of me, that list, the 12 people who are who um, who represent the episodes that will be released on May 20th. Each and every one of them is just a fascinating human being. And of course, it even includes and maybe especially includes your, your lovely daughter, who I just got to interview just a few weeks ago and, and who was able to join us for our Passover Seder amazingly um, online. But really, Isabella is such an extraordinary, I, you know, I know that our listeners will just appreciate the wonderment and miracle of this. How old is she? She's... Uh, she's going to be 11 by the time this podcast drops. That's yeah. right. So, you know, of this, of this 10, uh, she, she initially, I think said she was 10 and a half and we corrected her <laughs> close to 11. Right. So she's just an amazing human being and just so touching and inspiring in so many different ways. And I get to see 
my child, like who I am as a child, every time I interview, I'm so lucky to have occasional contact with with Isabella. And, you know, everyone from Spring Cheng, who's a world figure in managing what humanity is all about and just giving it a vocabulary that is useful for anyone. And Dennis Sandow, who's had his whole life transformed the ways that he also takes on humanity. Paul Dolman, a well-known podcast host in his own right, who just had a blast with me and both I had been a guest on his show and it was so great to return his favor and then get the, the wonder who he is as a human being and, and so many others. So I thank you for helping me arrange these guests and for being there as a co-director because it's honestly one of the, one of the if not the most fun thing I've ever done is interviewing these people and in a way that I know that other people will be able to appreciate and listen to them. I think the enthusiasm that we both share for getting this work out to the world, sharing these conversations, is pretty apparent. And I, I often think of myself as just bursting at the seams. Every time I listen to a new interview, I'm like, oh, my goodness, like, can we get this out today? Yeah. Uh, but of, of course, we want to do this right and do it on a sustainable and regular schedule. And so as Dr. Fred said, our drop date of the first 12 is going to be on May 20th of 2020. And then we'll be releasing a little bit more in some, uh, I'll call it bulk for a short period of time, but then quickly going to Welcome to Humanity Wednesdays, meaning every Wednesday we'll be dropping a new episode. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely go ahead and get subscribed now on iTunes. You don't have much to leave a review on based on this interview, but if you feel so inspired, please leave us a review as well, or let us know what you're looking forward to and anticipating with the show. And we also want to invite our listeners to go to welcome to humanity.net slash podcast and click on the first post to there and sign up to get notified uh, when the first episodes drop. So again, circle it on your calendar, write it on the back of your hand, uh, spray paint it on your bedroom wall. May 20th, 2020 is the drop date for the first 12 episodes of the Welcome to Humanity podcast. And Dr. Fred, as we wind up here, anything else you want to share with our listeners before we call this a day and anticipate our first official release? Yeah, you know, I I know he's going to be surprised when he hears this, but I'd like to acknowledge Bo Bennett. Bo and I are the ones actually who met before you and I did. And so, you know, I called Bo for services back in 2006, and uh, you were his right-hand man in the case, and that's how our friendship started. So I want to acknowledge him first for introducing you to me. And, and then all the fun work that we've had in the last 15 years is just extraordinary. And I also want to acknowledge Bo Bennett because he's also the first person who ever introduced the whole notion of podcast to me. In the podcast back then, I think in 2008, maybe I was in a podcast in Bo's basement with you. Those are some good times where I really just got a start of whatever this whole service was. And on top of that, isn't it great that I actually got to interview Bo Bennett as part of this Front 12 and what a completely brilliant soul that man is. His contribution to society and his willingness and his courage to look at how things go in the world comes out in that interview in, in so many different colors. And so I can't wait to release that particular interview. And again, deep thanks to Bo Bennett for introducing us and for introducing me to podcasts and then for being one of the, one of the charter guests on the first 12. So thanks. And I think that's it for now. All right. It's so funny. Everyone that you talk about, Dr. Fred, I'm, I'm like, no, that one's my favorite. No, that one's my favorite. Because yeah, right, <laughs> really a right. case can be made for each. They're all so wonderful. Thank you. So thanks, folks, for tuning in. Uh, please, again, subscribe at iTunes. Uh, leave us an anticipatory review, if you will. And be sure to check back on May 20th of 2020 for the first 12 episodes of the Welcome to Humanity podcast. Thank you, Dr. Fred. Uh, I'll also just say, if you're like that Ryan Levesque guy, I don't really like him. You're not going to be hearing much from me. You'll be hearing from Dr. Fred. And I can assure you, you are in the best of hands with the good doctor. So thanks, Dr. Fred. 
My pleasure. Thanks, Ryan. And although you're not being heard, it's it. Let's be real honest here. So much of what you say is coming through with who I get to be in this world and who I get to be as a as a doctor, or as a man, as a friend, as a podcast host, and as a member of the group of humanity. So it really, you're a key player in my life, and it's really wonderful to have you here, Ryan. So thank you for that, and thank you for this introduction, and we'll see you on the flip side. All right. Thanks, Dr. Fred. Take care. Bye.